Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to this fourth day of the school. So today for the first lecture, we have Tobias Frederico. It's a pleasure to have him here. Uh, he got his uh, bachelor's, master's, and PhD from University of Sao Paulo. And he has a postdoc uh, uh, at University of Washington. Uh, nowadays, he's a full professor at the Aeronautics Institute of Technology in Portuguese. Um, if I were to, to do a, a full presentation of Tobias, it would take uh, a time comparable to his presentation. So I'll, I'll, I'll make a brief one. Uh, for example, he has more than 300 articles in peer-reviewed journals. Right? Um, his main focus is on nuclear physics, but he works in a very wide range of topics, ranging from hadron and uh, light nuclear structure, uh, light front physics, CP violation, field body physics, code atoms, and the IFMOV effect. So, thank you for accepting our invitation to be here. About this topic, and uh, this is really a, a work uh, for uh, decades uh, with uh, Brazilian colleagues <clears throat> that we have been developing these ideas of universality in field body system. And the, the main effect that I will touch is the uh, Efimov effect and the Thomas collapse. And uh, from the point of view of the very broad physics is what uh, we call about scale symmetry and its breaking to a discrete one. I will exemplify that. So the plan of the lessons I divided, here are the topics that I am going to talk, the two lessons for today and uh, for now and for the afternoon. So I will put the context, which is the context uh, those concepts apply. And then, as I understand, there are many uh, undergrad students. I will give some uh, ideas on quantum scattering that are uh, fundamental, at least to understand the equations we use uh, to interpret or to represent this phenomenon. Then I will go through FADEV equations that are the three body way that you formulate uh, the, in terms of integral equations, you formulate the three-body problem for the bound state and the scattering. And then I will go to the famous uh, uh, Skorniakov and Thermatiriosan that indeed was the source of all these ideas. This, this uh, classic paper is from 1956, so it's almost 70 years old but it's very rich in physics and uh, essentially all the topics that uh, come, the initial ideas are indeed there. Even Fadev acknowledged this paper of Skorniakov and Thermatiriosan for the idea of how to decompose uh, this, the, 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 the wave function, uh, the three-body wave function. Okay, then I will touch about scale invariance, that is, a hallmark of this equation, and then it's breaking. You know? So I will spend some time explaining this, because this is very wide. Even in quantum field theory, you use that, that concept. Then I go to the three boson system, talk about specifically the FMOV effect, and then <clears throat> at the end of today, uh, I will talk now understanding more these properties of the Skorniakov and Thermatiriosan equation, I will uh, explore uh, with results uh, the EFIM of uh, bound states and virtual states, what are that, the EFIM of resonance, and then uh, I will continue. I will talk about limit cycles, scaling loss, and then some uh, new work that we have been doing the range correction that, of course, the potentials are not exactly of zero range. And then uh, go up to the four-body problem. Okay, so uh, the context. 
So we have to think, I mean, uh, those, the application of these uh, kind of ideas, I, namely very large systems and short range interaction, is, uh, has application where? In nuclear physics, but in special systems, when you have, uh, for example, the halo nuclei, that you have neutrons, for example, very far from a core. Then, of course, the wave function, if you think like that, that your neutrons is very far from the interaction range, this, of course, is, has some universal properties as the wave function essentially is an eigenstate of the free Schrodinger equation. But it's not only that. No? And then uh, there are the same, uh, the same kind <coughs> uh, of large system you found in atomic physics, in uh, atomic traps that the people are able to create very large molecules of neutral atoms, what the people call more recently cold chemistry, that you have ions, for example, reacting with sodium at very low energy, Lauro probably will, will talk about. And the idea is that, okay, so these are very large systems with respect to the potential. So uh, these ideas apply to uh, uh, when you have or the possibility. This is not Coulomb problems, no? Uh, are are um, potentials that decays pretty fast. I, I will exemplify like the Leonard Jones or even the nuclear potential that the tail is a Yukawa form. And uh, the other characteristic of this system is that they are weakly bound. What, how do we qualify the weakly bound? We qualify by wave functions very large compared to the potential range. And uh, how far you can go with that idea? Of course, you have to be in regions where your wavelengths are very large, so you don't uh, notice too much the detail of the potential besides its being of uh, short range. Okay, so now I will start uh, the example of the ilium dimer, no? that uh, not long ago they were able to, to see the, uh, uh, the probability, then the distribution of ilium atoms. And these you see, these are actual uh, results from uh, an experiment. So the idea, I, I will briefly uh, mention this experiment by the, by the German group. Uh, Dorfer is the, the, the uh, main name. Um, and they, they, they are able to have a, a, a helium, I mean, helium molecules, I mean, the dimer, the trimer. And then uh, you see that is a grating. I mean, they have different wavelengths. And then they collide here with some... Uh, 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 how I say, some foil, no? And then they, ha they, they blow up a laser, and then they explode this out very fast. So when they do this sudden breakup of your bound state, for example, your dimer, it's simply the particles fly away, but which, with which distribution? It just carry the, the probability density of the wave function, of the bound state wave function. And then they collect, sorry, they collect in a plate. And then they are able really to see the profile of the wave function. And indeed, the, the binding energy of the dimer is very small, as you can see, 150 nano electron volts. And the tail of the wave function goes very far from the potential. This is uh, the Leonard John potential, and you see it's very deep and very short. No? And of course, the wave function here, what it is, is the eigenstate of the free Hamiltonian. Cannot be anything else than the exponential. So in that sense, uh, universal no? and model independent. But the binding energy then depends on the details of the potential. So you need at least one scale to fix it, or the binding energy, or the scattering length. 
And the same experiment was also done with the ileum trimer in this, uh, I mean, well-known, uh, I mean, reported in 2015 in this uh, paper. And uh, they do the same experiment. They blow up, so you have here uh, the, the jet of uh, ileum trimer. They collide here, and then the, the laser beam blow up. So it should be a, a sudden blow up, so the particle just carries the information of the wave function, of the bound state wave function. And then they did the same. And they were able not only to see the ground state, but also the excited state. And here you can see, so this is the angstrom, the distance. Look, the potential is about, you see, uh, two, three angstroms, the range of the potential of two, two uh, two helium atoms. But you see, even the ground state wave function has a, a long tail. This is the, the, the counts of atoms. So this is what we call also one body density, if you like. Oops. <coughs> and then you see the big tail. And the helium trimer also has an FEMOB excited state. But even the ground state has, is universal. I mean, this is the... the the probability density of this state, when you rescale by the binding energy, is essentially this one. So this is a characteristic that we are going to see many times in FMO physics. You have a discrete scale. No? Properties repeat themselves with a given uh, uh, period, if you like. Okay, so this is just a schematic of the a scheme of the helium trimer. You, you see the distance between the helium trimers is about 15 angstroms in the ground state, in the excited state, 75 angstroms. So this is really very large. But stop, I mean, I, I mentioned the, the, the potential just to, to let you know. I, I don't know how many of you have seen the Leonard John potential. This is the kind of potential that is used for neutral atoms to to model it. Of course, there are realistic potentials. So this is a kind of potential that captures many of the physics. And if you tune a little bit the strength of this potential, you are able to reproduce binding energy or scattering, low energy scattering properties. And this is just a table I just took from Wikipedia, just for you to have an idea, of the van der Waals radius. Why? That is the distance, I mean, between the zero and the zero crossing of the potential. So it has a big wall here that comes from, from this term and the long and the short range tail from this one over r to the six. And you see that this van der Waals radius is about, you see, uh, a couple of functions depending on the, on the atom, on the pair of atoms. And this will be very important because one of the topics I want to discuss is what the people say about Van der Waals universality. No? I will explain, of course, this, uh, this more. OK, now we, I, I, I mentioned about uh, code chemistry, no? so, uh, and also code uh, uh, atom, atom, no? atomic system in traps. But the always, I think, about few molecules with few of these atoms. So people have already seen this is from 2006, they were able to see the trimer of cesium really crossing the zero energy, and they were able to tune through. You already heard about fast bar resonance, so I will not explain it again. So they are able to tune the scattering land. And then tuning the scattering land, they are able to have this uh, cesium trimer very close to zero energy. When this happens, the atoms would like to be together in a trap. If they like to be together, they collide, and they can form molecules. When they form molecules, they are heated, and they go out of the trap. So this is what uh, we call uh, uh, the recombination, the, three, the, the losses due to the recombination of these three atoms. But there are more, not only uh, systems of three identical atoms, but also mass asymmetric system. And there is also special molecules. Uh, we already 
uh, talked about the helium trimer, but you have uh, other um, uh, combinations that are form weakly bound systems. And this also allows you to think about this ultra cold chemistry because the binding energy are so tiny, so you collide them to, and to see the, the effects of these collisions or without breaking up everything, you really have to be a very cold, uh, very low temperatures. Now, going to nuclear physics. So this is a sketch, one of one of uh, so-called uh, realistic potential, argon V18, and here is the deuteron wave function for S wave. Now that is the, 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 the most important component of the deuteron wave function. And you see here, you have uh, the delta is a uh, spin one a positive parity state. It has a mixture of uh, S wave and D wave, L equal zero, L equal two. And this coupled system, of course, for the S wave, give you an effective potential. Now, and this is what is here. So this is L equal zero potential here. Then you have the, the, the other potential here. No, and the coupled potential that comes from L equal zero and equal two. Maybe you have heard that the tensor interaction is very important to the binding of the delta. But the most important uh, characteristic that or property that I want to, to call your attention is the long tail of the delta wave function. If you look, the potential is gone uh, more or less about, uh, you see here, uh, one, uh, one Fermi or something like that. No? And then you have this exponential tail that is nothing else that solution of the uh, free radial Schrodinger equation. Again, we, we should immediately uh, okay, see that uh, also some model independence should appear in low energy properties if we think about this delta. Uh, but it's not only the deuteron. Deuteron can be considered as a hollow system because the neutron and the proton are quite far apart. But there are many others. I, I'm here, I'm just calling, uh, I mean, mentioning helium-6. But helium-6, in particular, that is the, in, the, the dominant interaction between the neutron and helium-4, I mean, the alpha particle, is very compact in the nuclear scale and is in P wave. So this is not the kind of FMO physics that we are going uh, to discuss. This is more related, for example, to lithium-11, that you have a core of lithium-9, and uh, two neutrons, beryllium-14, carbon-22. No? And these systems we call, in this case, boromian systems. Why boromian? Because if you break uh, one bound, you break everything because the two-body subsystem is not bound. This is what happens when the scattering length is negative if you, have, if you think about short-range potentials. Okay, just to give an idea, a cartoon of what are the distances involved in a lithium-11. So you have the core is about three fermis. Of course, this is very short from the point of view of atomic physics, but not from the uh, point of view of the nucleon nucleon potential. And then uh, the neutrons are about a distance of six to eight fermis, so much larger than the core. Therefore, this uh, wave function is, could be quite well reproduced even in the limiting case of a zero range interaction, I, the tail of the wave function. The same for carbon 22. <coughs> Sorry. No, that is also very large, the halo. Okay, so now we go, uh, we start to go to the point uh, now and see, okay, what, what means one aspect of universality? Universality says that, uh, I mean, is the idea that you change the system as long as you change some scale, your wave functions or your R uh, looks as, as very similar. And to happen that, essentially, the wave function the, w w should have a large probability to be in a region where the potential is zero. Then, of course, uh, this, this is a solution of the uh, free uh, Schrodinger equation. No? And this, of course, is valid if you, t 
think about short range potentials and also small binding e e energies as well as long wavelengths. Because if you have something deeply bound, uh, the story is completely different. And uh, there is an important point that is this equation here. When you go to the large momentum, you see that you can make a transformation, uh, a scale transformation in your arguments that do not change the solution when the energy is zero. So this is what we call continuous scale invariance. And in the FMOV effect, this is broken. This is very beautiful. And of course, the physics also has to take into, into account the symmetry, if they are fermions, uh, we have to think about which are the number of minimal scales, and of course, dimension and masses. No? So these are uh, parameters that, of course, your wave function should depend. So again, universality, how do we think, is model independent. So if I change the potential a little bit, but keep the binding energy and maybe other properties fixed, what we see at the long range is exactly the same. No? And uh, to study this in the limiting case, we think about quantity interactions. No? And then uh, the problem with the contact interaction is the short range divergence, or what we call ultraviolet divergence. How do we treat it? OK, anyone, maybe you have heard in uh, quantum field theory, if you have a divergence, you have to trade with some uh, observable and fix some quantity. Then, of course, naturally, you will ask how many scales when you have, for example, a, bos a four boson system, a 10 boson system, how many scales or fermions? Maybe fermions is different. Why? Because you have Pauli principle and maybe at short distance you kill your wave function and maybe some of these problems uh, disappear. Okay, this is all about, I will talk these ideas over and over that I hope this message will be kept with you. Now, I will do some uh, some, I will give you some ideas, at least to visualize, because we have dynamics in this problem. And how do we think dynamics? So please just imagine that you have a little, uh, uh, little things uh, uh, floating in a surface of a lake, and then one then is moved, it, and then, for example, a, a circular wave is propagated, and touch the other, the other one start to oscillate, and so on and so far. So, and uh, what, did, for example, uh, this is just mimicking a collision of two particles, for example, and then what this particle is receiving from this part? The asymptotic information. If, of course, the region you create this wave is very small. No? OK, so now how do we treat that in quantum mechanics? No? So uh, this is essentially the ideas of quantum scattering. And I will give you, so uh, I know for the undergrad, maybe things will be new. For the other ones, you forgive me that this is too basic. But uh, uh, these are important to understand what follows. So uh, the situation we want to describe, imagine that the circular wave uh, the center of the circular wave is very far from the next particle, so you have essentially a plane wave you know, colliding with a scattering center, you know, and this uh, creates a scattered, this scattered wave function, and we have to describe. We need these mathematical tools. You know, in the way I will formulate the, the, the concepts of scale invariance and so on, I will need that. Okay, so we have the Hamiltonian here of this problem. We have the potential. I'm thinking in one body problem or two body problem in the relative coordinates. And then we have to formulate this scattering problem. And it is a solution for positive energy of the uh, free Schrodinger, equ of, of the Schrodinger equation, no? of the eigenvalue uh, of the Schrodinger equation. So what, uh, how do I solve it? So I take the Hamiltonian on this side, and then I have to invert the operator E minus H naught. No? 
But this, uh, how I say, homogeneous equation can have a solution that is exactly our boundary condition, the plane wave. So the solution for the scattering problem for energy larger than zero, than zero we'll have the plane wave, this is essentially representing here the plane wave, plus G naught, G naught is the inverse of E minus H naught, but we must be careful because this can have a zero, no? H naught is the kinetic energy, this is a positive energy. And this uh, we need to dislocate, and this gives you the chance to introduce the boundary condition of the outgoing wave. And you, you have indeed two possibilities, many possibilities, but we need to choose the one that gives you the physical solution. Okay, and then uh, asymptotically, if we just make the Fourier transform uh, that is written here of this resolvent, that is E minus H naught, we have just this uh, spherical wave. No? And then, oh, we, of course, we have to write this in configuration space and so on. When we go to the very large distance, this, the total wave function will have the plane wave, the initial one, plus what I was mentioning, no? the, the spherical wave in two dimensions, is just the cylindrical wave. We could do this problem in two dimensions. And then the scattering amplitude that carries the information on the, on the uh, phase of this asymptotic wave. No? And this, of course, from that you can get also, I mean, quantities like cross-sections no? that you really measure in the laboratory. And uh, this wave function asymptotically as well, you can write in terms, you, you see here, uh, th these solutions of the radial equations with uh, a phase shift, and this phase shift carries the uh, scattering information. And this will be the quantity that we are going uh, to use. Okay, so now we want to formulate uh, the T-matrix equation that carries the scattering information that is very important if you want to formulate this problem, uh, many body problem, in the, in the in integra, in integral equation form. So we need the solution of this, uh, of this scattered wave, and in particular, the T matrix. So if you look, if we, if we want to solve formally this equation, we can take this term, put it on the other side, then we have to invert this operator, and that's it. And then I apply to the plane wave. The, the inverse of this operator is nothing else than this operator where the T matrix satisfies this equation. You can say, oh, this seems too difficult, but it's very easy. If you iterate this, this equation here, and you iterate this one, you immediately will have the same structure or the same perturbative terms. Of course, you may say perturbation does not converge, but formula, you create exactly the same terms. And therefore, the solution you can write in terms of the T matrix. And you see here the, the scattered wave that has the plane wave plus this operator here. And this, this operator that carries the asymptotic information, some matrix elements of these operators. And in particular, what we call the on energy shell matrix element. So this momentum corresponds to a um, uh, plane wave state that has the incoming energy, so this is the scatter, I mean the, the wave number, and uh, this is, oh sorry, and this is the uh, uh, momentum of the outgoing particle, and this is exactly the, um, the scattering amplitude that carries the information of the phase shift. If we are at very, very low energy, the most important term of this sum is the L equals zero. Why? Because of the centrifugal barrier that kills everything else. Huh? And this is, is the essential ingredient that we need even in, when we talk about the gross pitayevsky equation, the scattering length, and so on. So now uh, let us go 
Now we are thinking about zero range potential. So obviously we say, what is the uh, T matrix for the zero range potential? Okay, what is the zero range potential? So this is a, uh, a local potential, a general local potential that we know that you have to have R prime equal R, big R in this case is just the distance between the two particles. And then uh, you could have here a Yukawa, a Gauss, and Leonard John. But in this case, we want to go to the limit. Why do we want to go to the limit? To see the minimum number of scales that we need to define these systems. So this is the minimum you can have. And the interesting property that mathematically is very useful is that the, the zero range potential you see here, the Dirac delta, is at the same time local and non-local that you can decompose, of course. This delta says that R prime, no, that uh, you should have R equal zero, and therefore uh, R prime is also should be zero. So you can also write in this separable form. Maybe some of you already done, have done this exercise. No? But I will do here, why I will do here? Because already we have a, a problem for at short distance. Okay, so this is the separable form of the potential. The matrix element in momentum space of this potential is just a constant. Here I wrote in the dimension, but doesn't matter. It's just what is important is that the potential is a constant, so you have a coupling constant. And uh, those uh, form factors that are just, you can uh, use one. No? And then, of course, there are, uh, with respect to this definition, there is a, a constant factor, that's all. In um, Hilbert space, we can write the, the potential in this form, like a project. Okay, this is the separable form. Okay, and the most important is that this potential does not depend on the direction of P. So therefore, this should only act on the S wave. No, because it's just a constant. So therefore, it does not depend on this direction. Or well, this can be only S way. Okay, so now the idea is to solve. This is the T matrix equation written now in momentum space. Remember that we are writing in a formal way. We could write in configuration space, in momentum space, or any other basis you like. Okay, so we have to put this potential here, and then uh, we see that the separability of the potential uh, has a solution the separability of the transition matrix. So formally, you can also see that you put it here, and then you just substitute, and then immediately you see that the solution of the transition matrix, so this is a small t of E, is just the operator t of E, I just wrote in this way. Then you have a function here, and we see here that uh, the solution gives you, this is just a kind of loop that you are doing, how you can see this loop. If you iterate this equation, you have the potential, potential uh, resolvent, that is indeed, this is the Fourier transform of the propagator for uh, future times and for, uh, I mean, going backwards in time is the minus sign. So if you iterate, you can see that you create these loops. And then the problem is here. This is a constant. So this is ill-defined. So it's divergent. So as well as lambda minus 1. A lambda is also ill-defined. But if it is ill-defined, I should define it in a way that I kill this divergence. OK. Uh, so now, uh, here is just, uh, uh, we need, no? now I, how we fix this? We say, okay, I put a cutoff. But there are infinite ways. I could multiply by a Gaussian, by exponential, whatever. But uh, the, 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 what we want to have is a physical condition. And one important property of the transition matrix is that it has a pole on the bound states. And we see here, no? 
I, if I have a zero, if I know how to fix the zero with a, fixer, with a physical condition, I can in some way try to, to manage this divergence, this ultraviolet divergence. And this is what is shown here. First, the transition matrix has a pole. Why? Because we can rewrite the transition matrix if you iterate. Here you see the iteration. In terms of the full resolvent of, the, of, of, of my problem. So E minus H, H my full Hamiltonian. And of course, if I, make, uh, if I project this on a complete set of states, you immediately see that this resolvent has a pole in the bound states of my theory. Of course, you could say, but if it, th there is no bound state, okay, well then we can see our solution and try to interpret. We can do it in many ways. No? But this is just one simple way to think about. Okay, so the bound state poles you know, give me of the resolvent are the poles of the transition matrix, and these give me one physical condition. Okay, if we know that the T matrix has a pole at a given energy, E2 minus modulus of E2 is the, the binding energy, no? is the bound state energy. Then, uh, of course, this uh, zero defines my lambda minus. But of course, it is still infinity. No? And th this is exactly the same process that we see in, Q in quantum electrodynamics. So we have to redefine the charge of the electron in such a way to kill uh, the divergence you have, for example. Fixing the charge. Here is the same, so it's very simple. If this is true, because I want a zero, a pole of my transition matrix at the bound state, I just substitute lambda minus by that. But when I do that, I immediately see, of course, here is a doubtful um, uh, mathematical operation, but then I say, okay, I put a cutoff, I regularize, then it's finite. Then I can uh, sum the two integrands and take the cutoff to infinity. This is what is written here. So now this integration is finite. I can, I can integrate. And for uh, negative energy, we see here the bound state poles. And for positive energy, these are epsilon matters. And these give the form of essentially of the scattering amplitude. That is minus k cot delta minus ik for positive energy. Now the point we see, if we have a bound state dominate a low energy, a shallow bound state dominating the physics, immediately you are going to see that k cot delta should be minus the square root of the binding energy, of the modulus of the energy. Okay, now we go to our point. So at, at very low energy, so we know that k cot delta for the S wave goes to a constant. And uh, this is uh, positive if I have a bound state, but it could be negative. So this is the scattering length that you have heard uh, many times here. But you have more terms in this, in this expansion. So this is the effective range expansion. That this quantity here is related to the size of your potential. No? And we want to see if we want to go to the limit of uh, our truly zero range potential, this term should be disregarded. But in principle, depending on your physical system, of course, there should be corrections. In my second lesson, I will mention that. So this is now the S wave scattering amplitude. We have here k cot delta, no? And then thinking on, on this term, it can be positive scattering length, so it's a shallow bound state, for example. If you, I'm thinking in shallow bound state. You can have repulsive potential, but always I'm thinking, the thoughts I'm having here are for attractive potentials, okay? And uh, so you could have it both positive and negative. Positive, we know. So this is essentially the analytic structure of the scattering amplitude in the complex plane of energy. So we have what we call the two-body cut. 
the two body cut is the scattering cut. So we go from real amplitude to a complex amplitude with a well-defined uh, form. So this is a cut in those equations. Maybe you have heard, or we can discuss later about how this appears, the, I mean, uh, these mathematical properties appears in the scattering equation, in the lipman schwinger equation. But we could also have negative scattering length. If I have a negative scattering length, you can immediately see that it appears a pole in my scattering matrix when K is minus I kappa. So this is what we call a virtual state. And what it is, I mean, uh, if it is very close, this pole, to the region we see the scattering, we are going to see this, the, the, this huge uh, effect from the negative scattering length, but there will be no shallow state. What is this? This is essentially the solution of the Schrodinger equation with the exploding exponential. You can have that, but this is, why, this is why we say a virtual state. We are not going to observe it on nature by itself, only indirectly through, for example, the scattering length. If the scattering length is very large, the cross-section can be very large. No? And, and this is what happens. For example, in the neutron-neutron system, the virtual state, is uh, at very low energy. This is 0.1 MeV. The, the energy of the delta is 2 MeV. So this is 20 times smaller. No? And this is very important for the properties of the halo nuclei. No? And there are other. Uh, in the case of the two helium uh, bound state of the dimer, we have the true bound state. But remember, negative scattering length is not repulsive interaction. It's attractive. No? but with a pole. And this, I just take this lesson from my, I like very much this book of our uh, uh, beloved no? professor uh, Toledo Pisa, the Toledo Pisa, no? and uh, this figure just illustrates that. No? So if you go to very low energy, your uh, wave function for the uh, scattering state, so delta goes to zero, so in such a way that delta over k is a constant, and this is nothing else than the scattering length. And then, if I have a virtual state, you see here how the, this, this wave function, so it just increase. And here is the negative scattering length. So if I go, go out of this, of, this, of this well, then you can imagine that this uh, zero energy scattering wave function will be, can be matched, no? with boundary conditions to the uh, exploding exponential. And this is uh, when you have a bound state. So your wave function should go to zero. But this is the scattering wave function at zero energy. And the same happens if, if you have a very deep potential. You can have excited states and so on. Uh, and then uh, the same uh, physics. I mean, the low energy physics of the two-body system is dominated essentially by few quantity or few scales. In this case, the scattering length and uh, going a little bit more, uh, the effective range. OK, I just want to flash this slide to let you know that we can formulate quantum mechanics. This was the work of our group for many years for singular interactions in, in a way that you can write what we call I, I will give words, I will not go in details, but I think it's interesting for the point of view of the students. Uh, exactly using the concepts of renormalization group e equations, Kalan's Imanzik equation. So we are able to rewrite the transition operator in a subtracted form in such a way, because if you remember, when we fixed the bound state condition, we did a subtraction. But we can generalize that to any order. And this is just formal manipulation. But with that, when we do that, we have to fix what we call the renormalized potential at some scale. And then you could say, according to Weinberg and many others, you can slide this scale. This, if the scattering matrix, I mean, or the transition matrix should be invariant, so this leads to renormalization group equations 
in particular to the kalan zimanzik equation. And that is also you can use the concepts of renormalized the Newtonian and so on. Now, uh, some of you that are interested, I put here the, 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 the literature. So this is really was created uh, here in our group for many years. Okay, so I give one example, for example, P wave. We can treat P wave. You see, this is just a, a contact interaction. This is two gradients, essentially. The scalar product of gradient of R and gradient of R, R prime, no? Um, and this is the matrix element already projected. Uh, I mean, I took out the Legendre polynomial. And then we can treat, I mean, in this potential, because of this singularity, you need two subtractions. So you can treat it, I mean, uh, cleanly. Of course, at the expense to introduce this subtraction point. But you should know that you can slide uh, the subtraction point. No, this is uh, the solution of the kalan zimanzik equation. No, I do not expect that you follow that, but I think these are very important concepts that you can already learn at the level of quantum mechanics. Okay, so now we go to the three body problem. No? So, Father, no? uh, Lucas, I will need a little bit more, maybe a couple of minutes, okay? Because I want to introduce the Father equations, okay? This is more or less at the end, almost at the end. Okay, uh, Fadev equations, now we start with the bound state. So the idea of Fadev was indeed uh, inspired by the work of Skolnikov and Termatirioza, you know, historically. And uh, there they introduced the decomposition of the wave function. This is there in, already in the paper by Skolnikov and Termatirioza. And uh, what they did, essentially here I'm making uh, formally, more or less, what they did. And I want to use the concept of the transition matrix and so on. So here, uh, if, you pass, if you go with, this t with the rest of it, no? to the other side, you invert. So this is just the Schrodinger equation. And here I have the three potentials. And I label this potential, this, this, I have the sum, I have three potential. I mean, potential between particles one and two, two and three, and uh, one and three. So this I just label IJ, no? So we have three potentials here. And then each of the terms here carry the resolvent, the free resolvent, and one potential was associated one, with one component of the wave function. Not what Father F did. He asked which is the equation that each, each of these components uh, satisfies, okay? So this is each of the components, as I mentioned, and I'm labeling here J, K, I, so in cyclic uh, permutation, one, two, three, two, uh, three, one, and so on, okay? So this is just a shorthand notation. So I can now rewrite uh, the, 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 the wave function in terms of the three components, is here, and then, I can take the component i to the other side, and look, I have essentially the same operator we saw when solving the scattering, I mean, the scattering equation for uh, the two-body problem. I know how to invert, no? I know how to invert. And the inversion, I can take the inversion of this guy, multiply by that, so this simply gives me g naught the two-body transition matrix, but in the three-body environment. Why? Because the kinetic energy carries the kinetic energy of the three particles altogether, not only two particles, but the kinetic energy of the three particles. And these are the father of equations. If we know the transition matrix, that we know for the zero-range potential already. So we can solve it. And this leads you to the Skolnikov and Thermatirosa. But the most important application of these equations are to the scattering. Why? Because it allows to introduce the boundary condition. Because there's a big problem when you formulate in terms of the uh, Lippmann-Schwinger kind of equations. You, you have problem of non-uniqueness. 
And uh, Fadev solved that. And indeed, in his paper, this first one is very accessible. I read this, at the, at the, the first one, not the, the book. But the first one, all these physical ideas are there. So if you want to read, it's, it's really very accessible, the first paper. You know, that there are all these the ideas. And then uh, he made a beautiful work proving it mathematically, that these equations are, have unique solutions. So now what we have to do, we look again to the Fadev equation, and we know that the homogeneous equation has a solution. What it is, is the boundary condition that corresponds to a bound state of the pair JK times a plane wave that corresponds, for example, to this scattering situation. So you have the bound state of J0 and particle I colliding to it. And what is the, 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 the initial wave function or your boundary condition? It's a plane wave times the bound state. If you go to the Jacobi coordinates, taking out the center of mass. And then uh, this equation already has unique solution and this there are different forms of this equation that are widely used in the literature. Okay, I'm almost there. So I will derive now the uh, Skorniakov and Thermaterios uh, uh, equations, homogeneous equations. So this, indeed, I'm doing the e inverse direction because Fadev inspi was inspired by this work. But I think it's very nice to have all these uh, uh, ideas uh, together. I mean, renormalization, Fadev equation, and then uh, Skorniakov and Thermaterios. So it's very simple. So this is the bound state equation. This is the transition matrix of the JK system. Already we know if we have a, a, a zero range potential, it has its form. But this form also applies. If you, if you have other form factors, people in effective field theory sometimes like to use Gaussians. You can use uh, polynomials, one over polynomials. There are an infinite number of possibilities. But the structure of the equation is exactly the same. Okay, then you introduce here and immediately you see that you factorize the, the, the um, dependence on the relative momentum of the pair JK. For example, here this could be this B and C could be J and K. So this is the relative momentum. And then you have whatever else you have just depend on the momentum of the third particle. I mean, the Jac these are Jacobi coordinates, relative coordinates. So you can formally rewrite your uh, FADEV, uh, the component of the phi wave, uh, of the FADEV, uh, the FADEV component of the wave function as uh, this tensor product that you factorize the, the, the relative momentum and the momentum of the third part, so the relative. And this is what we call reduced wave functions. And this equation, no, you can uh, formulate, no, you can introduce again psi j and psi k in form of those ones, and then you have, in, if you are in three dimension, this is an integral equation in three dimension with one momentum variable, because fj, fj and fk just depend on the more relative momentum of the third particle that is indicated by J and K and I. Okay, maybe I will stop here. No, that is, we start a little bit, uh, some minutes, I will stop here, and then in the afternoon, I will give you the Skorniakov and Mar Martyrios uh, equation and the physics uh, that, I mean, this old equation can give you, the rich, very rich physics. Okay, so open to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Tobias, for this wonderful lecture. Do we have any questions? Okay, please. Oh, okay. Hi, Professor. Hi. Uh, thanks for the lecture. 
Uh, my question is, uh, can you include the trap in the scattering theory? Yes, people does that, indeed. You can do that. You can put, uh, I mean, uh, the boundary condition in many ways. And I will mention that. Uh, not only uh, a three-dimension, I mean, a spherical symmetric trap, but also uh, asymmetrical trap, when you squeeze your system that you want to go. Uh, you can do that, and I mean, if you, uh, people use that, when you put particles in a trap, you, indeed, your states are discretized. But for the, from the distance between the, the, um, the energy levels, you can get the information about the scattering uh, amplitude or about your scattering line. This indeed, this kind of idea appears in many ways. For example, in uh, uh, quantum control, uh, chromodynamics on the lattice, no? that is done in the lattice, so it's discretized. And indeed, when they solve uh, some problem, they have uh, energy levels. From those energy levels, because are discretized, you can get the information of the scattering amplitude. But it's not truly a scattered wave that goes up to infinity, because in the case of the lattice, your, the state of your system is confined to that, to that box. Uh, people are using, uh, I, by chance, I was reading uh, papers about that a couple of weeks ago. It's People, not so common. Yeah, let, let, me, let me just... Uh, 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 there are many methods of getting bound states, no? I mean, when you go, for example, to nuclear physics, no? People are able to diagonalize big, huge Hamiltonians. And we have heard some examples here. And uh, when you diagonalize, indeed, you have to use a basis. And uh, many people use uh, the harmonic oscillator basis. No? Uh, and then, uh, okay, you have the bound states, but uh, you can have uh, states above, no, with positive energy that would correspond to the scattering region. Then, uh, from the levels, no, there are people thinking on how to the distance between the levels to get the information on the. Uh, scattering amplitude. But it's not, you, you get information from the scattering state putting your system in a trap. Okay, this is what you do. Uh, but, but maybe, I don't know if this is, was exactly what you were asking, but um, we can, uh, if we have a very large trap, maybe if you think in cold atoms right, that are confined, indeed the scattering no, uh, can be realized in that, there in the trap. Of course, the distance between the levels of the trap are almost uh, nothing. So this is on the continuum from the point of view of your, of your system. Then you realize the scattering. And indeed, these are the recombination process. People compute without the trap effect. You see? But if you have, then there will be the question. This I don't know how to answer, but I will put to you. You start to squeeze, and you have a very huge scattering light. Maybe the size of your squeezing start to be the size of your system. And then you are going to interfere. So you then probably, you, I mean, I believe you cannot define a scattering state in that sense. But for a very large trap, remember, at the bottom, this is just flat then, of course, you can define. And this is what people use. And many of, I mean, everything, uh, uh, many of the things I will present were indeed measuring cold traps for the few body systems. Okay? But this is a very interesting point, I mean, because uh, you could move. I, I will give, how do you say in, uh, in, uh, in cinema, you, you just say a little bit of the next, <laughs> of the next. Um, when we start to squeeze, I mean, the physics, even the, uh, um, uh, the scale symmetry that you have are changed if you go from three dimension to two dimension or one dimension. So effects like Efimov effect disappear in two dimension. 
So really, I mean, you could eventually, I hope one day, people will be see this kind of transition. I don't think it's still possible from the point of view, uh, experimental point of view, but uh, I mean, people are very creative. No? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. We have time for a quick question. Okay. Thank you, Tobias, for the nice presentation. Uh, I have a question about uh, the usage of uh, uh, the contact interaction. At the beginning of the presentation, you show us this Borromean system of uh, helium with two neutrons. But, the uh, helium and? Two neutrons. So two neutrons, yes, yeah, so on nuclear six. physics. Yeah, helium, exactly. helium six. Helium six. Yeah, yeah. Now, okay, as an exercise, I think that there is a system that has a two body. Um, state that is very close to unitarity, so very large scattering length. But uh, that is a clusterized system. So there is a neutron and then there is a um, compound, like helium, which has a neutron of the same kind inside. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still, I would say, morally justified to use a contact theory, even if I know that there will be some kind of Pauli repulsion. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, you, the way we think normally, we justify that. We, I mean, many referees have uh, uh, asked this question. We have to think that we have, I mean, your neutrons are very far away. So the overlap is very small. And we know that although we have the same ele electrons from you and mine are the same, the Fock term, I mean, the exchange term, is very small when you do. And uh, the idea that we pose is that. But of course, depending on the property, it may interfere. But in addition, I mean, this is one point. The second point is that this is important when you think about the microscopic construction of your observable. So we start with the two body potentials, with the degrees of freedoms of the protons and neutrons. Then you have to have the fully antisymmetrized wave function. And this will give you the binding energy. But in this kind of model, binding energy is an input and not an output. So you need to give an escape. So some of the effects, of course, are taken by the scale that you are defining, that you need to input in this kind of, uh, of modeling. Uh, but it's not everything, of course. But uh, if you go to the short, if you want to look for example, I, I can give you some examples of that. Unfortunately, I didn't put here because I thought it was too much. But if you, you want to look the wave function at very short distance, I mean, uh, within the core, for example. Oops, let, let me go here. With a figure, it's more easy for the audience to think about. Okay. So suppose that you want to look at the wave function or your... your um, uh, neutron distribution in the, uh, close to this whole. Of course, this will be very bad, for sure. But uh, if you want to look uh, at very large distance, this wave function is not bad once you know at least some minimal properties, like the binding energy and things like that. And indeed, I can tell you um, <laughs> two things about that. Uh, people have measured, for example, the and neutron-neutron distribution. I think it was even people in Ganil that do some experiments. OK. Uh, they blow up the lithium, and they measure the moment, relative momentum distribution. And this kind of theory is perfect <laughs> for this problem. But, but the relative momentum is very small so between it, the neutrons. It really depends on the, how yeah. big is the momentum of the scattering. So this cannot be too much. Yes, I mean, if you go to short uh, wavelengths, of course, these at some point start to break. So you we'll have to have these ideas in mind. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. I think it's the, now time for the next one. Yeah, we're running a little bit late, but if you want, there is a second lecture by Tobias, yes. and he will be delighted to answer for your questions yeah. during coffee break. Uh, during coffee break. And Let's thank him again. Thank you. <laughs> Lucas, okay, okay.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Professor Caldera. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So we have a ple the pleasure to have you here for the second lecture about quantum uh, dissipation models and applications. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, good morning for all. And uh, let's start with the uh, continuation of what I started to uh, do yesterday. And uh, I showed you that uh, in many uh, circumstances, some superconducting devices or even superconductors, uh, some sort of uh, bulk superconductors, they, uh, can be, they, they can be described by some sort of collective coordinates. And these collective coordinates, they represent the dynamics of a bunch of electrons in a sort of ordered fashion. And uh, so uh, usually, uh, what we, uh, we can get is something like this. So these uh, effective equations of motion are always of this form. They have an inertial term and a sort of a dissipative term too, on top of some sort of conservative potential and a fluctuating force. So uh, yesterday I only showed you the uh, equations for the average of this Q variable. Or we can think of a point particle or a string, you know, something like a generalized continuum uh, version of this equation here. So, uh, but basically uh, the Langevin equation, which is the paradigm for the uh, this sort of motion I was talking about yesterday, it has this uh, fluctuating force, which has zero average and is delta correlated. The main point here is I'm really uh, aiming at quantum mechanical effects and uh, how to reconcile dissipation and quantum mechanics. Well, that's a very long-standing problem. People try to uh, quantize open systems for a long time with many different purposes. And, uh, but the thing is that I will not address these possibilities here. I will take a very pra pragmatic point of view, namely that uh, there is no sort of dissipative system on its own. So we always have a sort of universe which has the system of interest coupled to some reservoir or environment. And uh, so that's my point of view here. I will address the issue of the, the subsystem dynamics. So uh, since I have a closed system, which is uh, H system, H interaction and the environment, I can apply the quantum mechanical uh, uh, procedure for quantization and whatever. And uh, so uh, let, me, let me try to show you what the program is. And uh, we start with the uh, full density operator for the complete universe, namely system and environment. And then we have the average of some sort of distribution, some given probability distribution. And then we have the uh, complete state of the universe, system and environment. So that's the cap side and the bra side. And that's the uh, density operator for the full system. And that's the time evolution of this guy. Here. And uh, so I have this sort of uh, unitary evolution for psi and this one here for uh, the, uh, the bra. And once we are interested in um, average values of observables of the system only, like a coordinate position, uh, like coordinate or momentum. So what we have to do is to trace all these uh, variables here. And uh, we have to trace, take the trace of row times the uh, observable. And that turns out to be, since this guy here does not depend on the uh, environment coordinates, we can first trace over the environment coordinates. And then we uh, end up with something which is called the uh, reduced density operator of the system. And that's the uh, row tittle. And uh, so this row tittle is uh, the trace of the environment of the full density operator. So um, that's exactly the, uh, the object that I'm going to use to uh, compute averages of any observable of the system only. Now, the time evolution of the density operator is then something like uh, it has this. Uh, I don't want to bother about commutations and all that with the operators that will uh, 
be around so I can use the path integral representation for this uh, full system, for the time evolution of the full system. And uh, that's given so the coordinate representation of this uh, unitary operator for the evolution of the full system is given by the double path integral over the uh, exponential of the action, the action of the full universe, system plus environment. And uh, so that's the evolution of, say, the, uh, the cat, the cat. And there is also the evolution of the bra. And then I have to average over the uh, possibilities of many different states and uh, take the final trace over the same sort of configuration. And uh, so that's the, uh, the idea behind the, uh, the time evolution of the reduced density operator. So uh, once we do that, we end up with something like this. The reduced density operator has a double convolution and here we have the initial state of the uh, system only. And uh, this guy here is called the superpropagator. And what is the superpropagator? The superpropagator is something like, uh, well, if we had no coupling to the environment, that will be uh, the integral over all these paths, x here, for the, uh, the time evolution of the, uh, the cat, and y, this, uh, time evolution for the bra, which is the uh, complex conjugate of the other one. And uh, so there will be no such a thing here. And then we'll have the time evolution of two distinct uh, parts of the system. But now there is the coupling of the system to the environment. And then there is a sort of feedback of all these effects, the interaction of the system on the bath, and then the bath responds back on the system. And uh, so, and that's called all this sort of a feedback process is contained in here. And this guy is called the influence functional. And this influence functional couples exactly this uh, time evolution of the bra and the time evolution of the cat, so to speak, in such a way that uh, we have only uh, the subsystem dynamics these two subsystem dynamics, they are coupled through the environment. So it's something quite simple to understand once we uh, just write that in general terms. The, the issue here is really to find out the form of this uh, influence function. Now it's a bit eerie, so to speak, and uh, something big, it has to, uh, we have to couple all these time evolutions that uh, are buried here, for instance. We have the time evolution of the environment subject to, to histories X, and the time evolution of the environment subject to histories Y. One of them is for the uh, cat and the other one for the bra. And then I have to average over some initial condition, for example, that I'm taking separable initial conditions here, and uh, add all these uh, possible final configurations. So the thing here is that, uh, so I'm really thinking about the time evolution of the environment subject to a given history of a particle for the uh, forward in time and backward in time. And then I make the final uh, statistical average. And now, so that's what we have to compute in order to uh, be able to compute later on the time evolution of the subsystem only. Uh, so, the thing here is that, uh, of course, this is a very, very uh, tough job. You know, once I have a very general many-body system, namely the environment, how can I really uh, compute this uh, influence functional? And the thing is, we have two choices. Either we start with realistic models for uh, the whole uh, universe, or I take a simple, not that thing here is not HS, but it will be uh, HR, actually, you know, it's uh, the environment, could be a very general many-body system, and uh, I can just put in the computer and try to compute the uh, influence functional. But I can also do something else. Since I know that in the classical description, I will have the Langevin equation, I can try a sort of very simplified model for the environment 
in such a way that it can reproduce the uh, classical Langevin patients. For high temperatures, for instance, I can reproduce the classical Langevin patients for my variables. So, then I will take this sort of uh, approach. The second one, namely, uh, I will couple a system, a mechanical system, which has the inertial term and the conservative potential, and I will couple that by linearly to a set of non-interacting harmonic oscillators. So, it's something completely quadratic, and I hope that I can uh, compute the uh, influence functional exactly. And on top of these uh, terms here, we also have a counter term that we will explain why it exists very soon. And uh, so that's my uh, general model. And uh, on top of that, I will define some spectral function with a combination of all these uh, coupling constants and frequencies and masses of these uh, harmonic modes of the environment. And uh, in such a way that every time, once I will uh, try to de describe the dynamics of, the, of my coordinates, of course I will uh, have every, every now and then, I will have some sort of summation of all these modes. And then I can replace these summations by integrals over this spectral function. And this spectral function, I will assume to have this sort of behavior, constant and a power law for very low frequencies or frequencies lower than a given cutoff. So it's linear up to a given cutoff. And then it's zero beyond this cutoff. And this AS, it has these dimensions of mass and time to the power S minus two. And uh, so, for ohmic dissipation, for instance, eta uh, q dot in the equation of motion, what we have is that this s here is equal to one. So when s equals one, we uh, we have the so-called ohmic dissipation, and uh, ohmic dissipation gives us eta q dot in the equation of motion. Then we have subohmic for s between zero and one, and superohmic when s is greater than one. For instance, Abraham Lorentz equation for the radiation damping is omega cube. And omega cube will give us x triple dot in the equation of motion. So, uh, the, then we have a very general model. And I'm claiming, I'm not going to show you the steps of this derivation, but I can tell you that uh, this model, this very simplified model, if I try to describe the equation of motion for Q, they will be the equation of motion for Q, it will be of the same form as the equation for the Brownian motion. And uh, so what you have to do is to try to do quantum mechanics with this system. But I will do quantum mechanics with this system using my reduced density operator. So the thing here is that uh, the resulting dynamics will always depend only on this phenomenological parameter eta and temperature, of course. So, uh, two comments about the model I'm using. Uh, that model we can show using this sort of transformation here, when the canonical, this canonical transformation, we can show that that model is entirely Q equivalent to the model of, instead of coordinate, coordinate cup. If I have coordinate velocity, with these uh, rescale coupling constants, and no counter term, it, they will give you the same sort of dynamics. So uh, actually what is behind it is really the sort of Lagrangian of A dot V for the electromagnetic field coupled to a mass. And when we go to the Hamiltonian, there shows up one diamagnetic term, A squared. And that's basically what happens here. And uh, so we can, I'm just telling you that these two models, they are completely equivalent. There is another way to write the, uh, the model I introduced, introduced before, which is that if I rescale the coordinates this way here, I can write the Hamiltonian for the system. I gave you the Lagrangian, but you can go to the Hamiltonian formulation. 
with no problem. And we have exactly this sort of term here. So the counter term is something that if I rescale the variables, they will be included here in this term. And uh, so we can re uh, redefine masses and redefine the uh, spectral function. And what is funny about this model here is that uh, once we have no external potential, it's completely translation invariant. So uh, that model I showed you in the first place, the, fir the first form of the model is entirely equivalent to this one here. So what I have is a sort of very general string. General potential can be a non-harmonic, doesn't matter. And uh, so I have all these oscillators just coupled to the uh, single particle. And that turns out to be a uh, manifestly a uh, translation invariance when I have zero external potential. So uh, what I have is that I can really, uh, it doesn't really matter where the uh, ground and particle is. It responds the same way in a sort of uniform environment. So that's what it's saying. And now, let's go back to the uh, specific case we're dealing with. So uh, I want to be able to study uh, the dynamics of variables of the system only, or some sort of equilibrium properties of the subsystem. And uh, in order to do that, I anticipated that I have to compute this awful thing, namely the uh, influence function. But it's not that awful. So uh, I just tried to, uh, to give you a flavor of what is really behind the uh, computation of this influence function. But now, in order to uh, compute SI, so the, that's the interaction action, and SR, so that's a force and harmonic oscillator, because all these guys here, they are harmonic modes, right? I have these uh, K modes, and then we have force and harmonic oscillators, because the external particle is providing uh, the particle, the, uh, the, K os the K oscillator, with a sort of external force. And then, once I do that, I can compute the classical action, because that's the class called action that will come to the exponent of the uh, functional integral in the Feynman uh, version. And then, but that can be computed. We can easily solve the, uh, compute the action of a force of the harmonic oscillator, classically. And we, we also have to compute averages over the uh, equilibrium configuration of the environment at initial time. And that I can assume, for instance, that these guys are just uh, harmonic oscillators in equilibrium. So if I do that, that's the sort of uh, uh, density operator that I have for the environment in thermal equilibrium at temperature T. So if I put all these guys together in this uh, form here, I end up with this uh, super propagator. So uh, there is this uh, propagator for the uh, cat, of, which will be the cat of the system, the bra, and something that couples these two uh, time evolutions. From here onwards, I will refer to that as the uh, forwards and backward time uh, dynamics of the subsystem. So these two guys are coupled now and are coupled through the, the uh, interaction with the environment. And then we have, so part of it will come to the imaginary part of the super propagator and the other part to the real parts and the other part to the real part of the super propagator. But now, mind you, well, in fact, well, that's uh, terrible to play with. Yes, it's a double path integral, but the uh, hard part is here. No, it's not. We can have cubic potential, quartic potentials, just name it. Because the part here is quite simple, because it's quadratic. And path integrals can be exactly solved if they are quadratic. Gaussian path integrals. And it doesn't really matter that they are not local in time. You know, that's something I can handle with Fourier or Laplace transforms in the uh, appropriate time. So. Uh, 
these guys here, this alpha R and alpha I, these, uh, these expressions are given by the summations of a K. As I anticipated before, I have the summations of the coupling constants, masses, and frequencies of the oscillators, and uh, those can be uh, turned into integrals, and we can use these those uh, spectral functions I defined before. And if we do that for the uh, case of ohmic dissipation, which is the one uh, we are interested in, we can we get this sort of a double path integral solve. So uh, the thing is that uh, once we have something which is uh, easy to deal with for this S0, which is the uh, just uh, the external potential to which the particle is subject, you can easily uh, solve that either within approximations to this part here, not to the other one, because the other one has been exactly taken care of, right? And uh, so that's the beast we have to deal with. But that is, that can be done. And uh, so that's one thing. If I have the real time dynamics of the system, that's what we have to do to play with this uh, super propagator. But some other times we want to play with the reduced density operator of the system only in equilibrium. Right? And once we do that, we don't need that double path integral. All we have to do is to write the full equilibrium operator and trace this environment out. When we do that, the, dif the difference now is that I have only one integration, path integration for the uh, system variable, because this one here will be uh, taken care of by this uh, trace over the configurations of the environment. And that's our back to the uh, original model. And uh, we can do that. And we can show that the final form for the reduced density operator of the system in equilibrium is given by this uh, integral here. And uh, so the final form of the whole thing, I will, uh, of course, omit all the steps, is given by this uh, single path integral of an effective action. And this effective action is an imaginary time, because now I'm talking about temperature. And uh, so this effective Euclidean action is given by the Euclidean action of the system only. Now, here comes the influence of the uh, environment at finite temperature. Now I'm talking about the, the su subsystem in equilibrium with the environment at a given temperature. So I can try to compute variables Q square average of a given of a particle in a given potential once it is also acted by a external environment. So again, this alpha has to do with all these coupling constant masses and frequencies of the oscillators, which I can replace by integrals and apply my uh, prescription of uh, eta omega, which is omega dissipation. When we do that we end up with this nice kernel, which is eta divided by 2 pi, 1 divided by tau minus tau dash square. So uh, that's what we have to do. And again, as far as this part here is concerned, it's Gaussian. Again, the difficulty comes here. So uh, I will have to be uh, uh, clever enough in order to uh, propose approximations to deal with this part here. Right, so um, let's give some applications. The first one, one can really imagine. That's a very, very old result of ours, uh, Tony and I, that, uh, and mine, that uh, we had a sort of a wave packet and give it a kick in the beginning. And so that's one harmonic potential. So that's my uh, initial wave function, right? And all I have to do is to build the initial desk operator for that, which is trivial. I'm assuming that there is no interaction with the system at t equals zero, and then make this uh, super propagation of this uh, initial desk operator. And that turns out to be uh, something like this. I have one Gaussian initial state, and it will be Gaussian always. But then I will have this uh, center, which is uh, time dependent, and that's the width of the Gaussian, also time dependent. 
And this time dependence turns out to be uh, exactly what we expect from classical physics. Uh, the center of the packet evolves to like the center of uh, like a particle that I give a kick in the harmonic potential, and that's it. So uh, it's a simple classical model. We expect that because all of my modes and the particle itself is harmonic. So uh, that's what we have. And these guys here, that's the relaxation time, eta by 2m, and this uh, modified frequency of mega naught minus gamma squared that we know from classical physics. And the width at equilibrium is something like this. And uh, that turns out to be uh, the Koch H bar nu 2kt. And now this uh, imaginary part of the response function of a depth oscillator. And that's nothing but the fluctuation dissipation theorem. So uh, I can take this Gaussian, evolve it in time, and then it will uh, follow the uh, classical path and the width in the equilibrium will be uh, given by the fluctuation dissipation theorem. So that's great. And uh, so we can always write that, this uh, width in equilibrium, as h bar 2m omega naught, which is the, uh, the scale of the width of the minimum uncertainty uh, wave packet. And this dimensionless function and this dimensionless factor is gamma divided by omega naught. And we can see either for underdamped or overdamped system, systems that uh, we always, this F, always tend to reduce the width of the uh, system. It's always less than one. So uh, my system starts like a Gaussian. It will uh, end up in equilibrium at, uh, you know, uh, an infinite time. And its width will always shrink a bit, depending on the damping that we have. Uh, sorry, okay. Now... Another possibility, another very old result. I can place two wave packets within the harmonic well, not two particles, a single particle in a sort of uh, delocalized state. It's a sort of uh, microscopic Schrodinger, Schrodinger state. Right? So uh, I can make the uh, linear superposition of these two possibilities, two harmonic uh, potentials. And I can see what happens. And then what we have to do is this guy here will evolve, will relax. This guy here will also relax. Maybe it's there at the center of the potential, so it will change its width. The point here is this rho interference. Rho interference is, uh, it comes from uh, psi star psi. And uh, we can make the time evolution of this uh, term here. And the time evolution of this term here turns out to be something like the square root of rho 1, square root of rho 2. Like the interference is the square root twice the square root of intensity 1, intensity 2, and the cosine of a given function of space and time. But now, a novelty here. What happens is that we have a new term showing up. And this new term we can approximate by an exponential of this big gamma t. So the question is, what about this big gamma? How do you relate it to a small gamma, which is the relaxation frequency? And the thing is that we can show, for instance, that, uh, oh, that's a long and tedious calculation, but it's actually soluble again. And we can show that this big gamma is uh, always a factor times the relaxation uh, frequency of the system. Let's look at the uh, zero temperature. It's n times gamma or n times omega naught squared by two gamma, which is for extremely over that systems. And this n is nothing but the distance between the, uh, the two packets in unities of the width of the packet itself. And kappa is h bar omega naught by air kt. So uh, we see that uh, what happens is that uh, we can have the destruction of this uh, interference term in a time scale much shorter than the relaxation time, right? Because now we're talking about relaxation frequency, which is much higher, relaxation time will be much shorter. 
And uh, so what happens here is that we have two packets and some sort of interference. Now, uh, if they are very far apart, what happens is that even before they overlap for the first time, they will have no interference left. So uh, that's the complete destruction of interference, right? So that's one of the first examples of decoherence in this sort of context. And uh, now, that was a paper in 1985, right? And only in 1996, so 11 years later, uh, these two people, they were able to produce these sort of states. For instance, in optical, in superconducting cavities, we can make the superposition of two very uh, different phases, alpha and minus alpha, for the electromagnetic field, just measuring the states of atoms and so on, with the atoms, it's a very clever way to, uh, to play with it. Or this other play, play, uh, example here, which is, which is a trap of beryllium ions, and uh, these guys were able to uh, produce linear superposition of the beryllium ion into displaced states. So uh, that's exactly the sort of uh, realization of the sort of uh, uh, physics I've just shown you. And uh, now, another important problem is the, uh, as I showed you, because of really I'm addressing all these, uh, these two uh, first applications were some sort of academic, but now I'm trying to aim at examples I, I gave you yesterday, like the decay of a metastable state. So what about the decay of a Brownian particle? The decay, of, the decay of a Brownian particle we can handle through the equilibrium density operator for the composite system, and then I trace the environment, and I try to find the imaginary part of the uh, energy of the composite system. So uh, when we do that, again, what you have to do is to solve this uh, path integral here. And uh, it turns out, I'm not going to develop all these details step by step, of course not, but what we have to do is to uh, compute all these paths coming from the metastable configuration back to it and uh, through this uh, imaginary time version of the path integration. So this effective action is the action I showed you before. So it has this one over tall dash minus tall double dash square in this uh, effective influence of the environment over the system itself. By the end of the day, the uh, decay rate, which has to do with it, which is twice the imaginary part of the uh, energy divided by h bar, this big gamma has nothing to do with the gamma of the coherence problem, right? It's another one. So it's a prefactor exponential of minus b divided by h bar. H bar. That's basically WKB. We're talking about WKB approximation here. As I said, the difficulty comes from this uh, potential, the external potential to which the particle subject. And now what I have to do is to take this uh, stationary phase approximation for h bar going to zero. That turns out to be the WKB approximation and then this effective action is something, which is the uh, former one, uh, that's q dot square, not double dot. And this guy here is the uh, is positive definite. So I always increase the exponent. Even if I increase the prefactor, this increase in the exponent is the dominant. So in this case, what we, what we have is that uh, the tunneling rate is reduced. And that's exactly what we have. So if we take the log of gamma, gamma minus one, log of gamma minus one minus one, it has this sort of behavior. It's linear, and I will tell you exactly what this linearity is all about. And then at a given crossover temperature, it flattens. And this uh, crossover temperature will depend on the damping. For extremely damp systems, this crossover temperature is very, very low. For not so uh, damp systems, it's much higher. So that's the correction for low damping systems. And it's always, it has to do with this eta, Q naught square. And uh, for strong damping, 
that's the result that we have. And then in terms of order of uh, omega naught divided by gamma, because gamma here is very, very, it's much higher than omega naught. And the classical decay rate, which is the Arrhenius factor. So look at this. It's exponential of uh, V naught, which is the energy uh, barrier, divided by KT. So uh, if we take gamma minus 1, it will be exponential of plus. And now we take the log. So it will be uh, V naught, it will be KT divided, V naught divided by KT. So if I take log gamma minus one, minus one again, it will be uh, KT divided by uh, V naught. So uh, that's the linear behavior that we have. That's a renius. That's a complete thermal activation of the barrier, right, over the barrier. So uh, as we start to lower the temperature, we will flatten this uh, thing. And then we'll have this sort of finite lifetime, even for damped systems. Now, that's for the uh, decay by uh, decay of a metastable state, like the one that showed up in the squids. But for the squid, I have another possibility, namely the uh, bistable potential. For the bistable potential, we have some sort of quartic potential. And then, just remembering what happens for the non-dissipative uh, system, what we have is these two lowest lying states, these uh, psi even, psi odd, which are the uh, linear combinations of right and left of these uh, states of the particle on the right and on the left. Mind you, uh, Every time I'm saying I'm talking about a particle, this particle is uh, fictitious, right? Actually, it's the thing represented by that collective coordinate, okay? Now, so uh, we can compute this, the, uh, split, the energy splitting by uh, computing this uh, overlap of the uh, right and left wave functions. And what happens if I put a particle on one side or the other side of the barrier? It will start to uh, tunnel coherently uh, from one side to the other, right? Of course, if I put even or odd, they are either states, they stay there. Otherwise, I can just prepare on one side or the other side of the band. They will oscillate. Now, what about damping? What we have to do now is to uh, couple this quartic potential to my original uh, environment. And that was shown by uh, Tony and uh, collaborators in 1987. Again, another quite uh, old result. That this sort of model can be mapped into uh, something like this, which is uh, like uh, a particle, a spin subject to an external field, and actually uh, two external fields. Uh, one external field in Z and X components, right? And that's coupled to the environment. And uh, so there is a sort of a change from delta naught to delta. And uh, I can play with this sort of a spin boson Hamiltonian now. So uh, it's a two level system coupled to the bath of oscillators. So I'm really restricting myself to those two lowest line states. So this uh, spin boson is analogous to the N NMR block equations. So for Sx, we have the relaxation with the scale T1, which is the relaxation time. So this is the phasing time. And uh, so what we're looking at is the uh, average value of Sz, which turns out to obey this sort of equation. So uh, it can go from one side of the barrier to the other, but in a sort of damp way. So in the end of the day, it will be either on one side or the other side, or it will uh, be equally uh, populated. Actually, in this case, it will be equally populated on one side and the other side. So it will be a P equals zero, as that is zero. So it is distribution on the right and left hand side of the barrier. So uh, if you use perturbation theory for the environment, say that the environment is only disturbing very weakly the system, we can show that these two times they are equal and they are given by this expression here, this J of delta. It's just eta delta, right? This is my spectral function computer that delta. Right? And in general, what we have is that the phasing time is less than twice the relaxation time. Now, what happens now? Uh, what happens is that uh, what we have is a sort of uh, 
dimensional S damping, which is eta Q naught square divided by uh, two pi inch bar, and we have this renormalized splitting. And what we uh, what we can show here is that uh, that's alpha and that's temperature. We have a very very rich phase diagram. Depending on the region where we are, we have a very different dynamics for the system. So I will uh, just resume for you what one can get. For instance, uh, if we have this region A alpha, that's this point here, I forgot to uh, put it there, is alpha equals one. So alpha equals one, so if we go beyond alpha equals one, to t equals zero, what happens is the complete blocking of the uh, by stable potential. If I place a particle on one side, it will be there forever. Now, if I just uh, turn on the temperature of the system, I come to this uh, region B. And for region B, what happens is that we have exponential decay. So I place my particle on one side of the barrier, and then it will relax exponentially to zero namely uh, these two populations will be, uh, or probability, will be uh, one, and then it will become half, and the other one half, but then it will uh, decay exponentially. So that's what happens for this uh, B region here, which is quite large. So finite temperatures, once we have the uh, temperature above this line here. Now, and these are the uh, relaxation time for this uh, uh, thing to happen. And so that's B and also C. C here, this line here, it also has an exactly, uh, it's an exactly soluble model. And uh, this uh, line, again, it obeys an exponential decay, right? So we, uh, we still have to talk about D and E. So these are regions here. And uh, D and E, so that's again, what I showed, uh, what I told you about this uh, exponentially uh, decay region. Now, I can come to this uh, D region for D region alpha between a half and zero. And for this one, we can show that as a function of this Y variable, which is an effective splitting times its time, it has this uh, part of it is a coherent relaxation. And this coherent relaxation as a cosine term and an exponential. And there is also some sort of incoherent contribution, but there is this uh, nice coherent behavior which is oscillating there. So we can get in this region some sort of uh, coherent oscillations still between Q0 divided by two and minus Q0 divided by two. And so we can oscillate between one region and the other. So one can start to guess if I want to play with these guys as a qubits, for instance, this is the region which will be very interesting because this one, I, will, uh, I can have some sort of uh, coherent oscillations and then I can make use of that in technical terms. So but we will return to this point later, actually tomorrow. Uh, so and then we have incoherent relaxation between uh, alpha, half and one. Again, let me tell you a bit more about uh, models for dissipation. So everything I've just told you is uh, related to this uh, approach, very pragmatic, that I, I can reproduce the uh, Langevin and equation in the classical regime, and then I can use all these machinery of Feynman Vernon, whatever, in order to uh, describe the effect of damping on quantum mechanics. But it is implicitly assumed that I have uh, time-independent damping. And uh, of course, the model is not simply academic. Actually, it can show that it's quite general. Every time we, we can make sure that the environment is, is responding to the uh, external excitation in a sort of as a linear response system, then we can safely use our bath oscillators and things like that. But, there are other situations when we want to uh, apply a sort of more first principle model. For instance, what about a uh, particle moving in a fermionic or bosonic path, right? In one dimension, let's say. So I have 
external particle and I have just uh, bosons or fermions, even free ones. And then I have this contact potential. They, all, they, all, they can only interact with the external part. So I can perform this unitary transformation and show that I can transform this Hamiltonian into this one here. And I can also use a second quantized form for my many body system and rewrite my uh, Hamiltonian in this form. So uh, that's the total momentum of the environment, namely many bosons or many fermions. And uh, so this guy here is reduced to the uh, fermions or bosons being scattered by the uh, particle fixed at the origin, for instance. So uh, that's what happens here. But then we can, uh, this J here is just the uh, momentum of single particles, and that's the usual uh, representation, second quantized representation for the momentum. And once we do that, we, again, uh, it's, more, it's not so simple as the uh, former one, but now we have to play with coherent states for bosons or fermions. And then we can find, again, the influence functional, and we can perform some sort of Gaussian approximation for the external particle moving in these uh, bosonic or fermionic bound. And these are the uh, imaginary and real parts of the uh, influence function. This guy, uh, these gamma r and gamma i, they are given by this uh, transition, this uh, matrix element for the momentum, and thermal numbers. And uh, this guy, I can also define instead of a j function, spectral function, I can define a sort of a scattering function, which can be related to the, uh, to the former one, too, to the J function. Too. But now, we can write some sort of uh, time-dependent gamma or time-dependent diffusion in momentum space. And these are given by these two expressions. And you can just uh, perform some calculations for a repulsive contact potential, for instance, delta-like potentials, we can show that gamma of t, for instance, and also uh, d of t, these guys, uh, they, they become instantaneous. So uh, we can play with a sort of instantaneous approximation for those two. And this gamma bar is now a function of temperature. And this function of temperature depends on the uh, refraction coefficient of these uh, particles being scattered by the delta potential, right? And uh, so that's something that we played with in 1995, Antonio Castro and myself. And uh, then we could find, for instance, this sort of behavior for fermions, depending on the strength of this delta potential, greater or less than uh, the Fermi energy. So that will be uh, the gamma of T for fermions and the gamma of T for bosons in one d so there is no Bose condensation here. But now, the thing is that uh, we had also played with a particle moving in a Luttinger liquid. And the behavior of the damping for a particle in a Luttinger liquid is not exactly like this one here. So it's amazing. So the thing is that uh, after we uh, solved this uh, sort of uh, problem, uh, Antonio and uh, Matthew Fisher, they uh, performed a sort of randomization group perturbation theory for the uh, 1D fermionic system. And they again reproduced the T to the fourth behavior that we had before for the particle moving in the Luttinger vector. And the thing here is that uh, the Gaussian approximation is not so appropriate for this case, because then we have to take it, oh, the, the right thing to do is that uh, for low velocities of this, the external particle, we cannot conserve momentum and energy for the fermionic system at the same time. And then what happens is that uh, we have to freeze back scattering in this case. So, and then when we do that, we we back to the Luttinger liquid. 
And back to the Luttinger liquid, we, uh, we have a completely different behavior now because all, we only have four in the schedule. But that turns out to be uh, very useful when I say, well, a particle in a Luttinger liquid, I can make a sort of coupled field theory of a Schrodinger-like field for one particle and the Luttinger liquid, which is uh, the 1D electronic system. And then I can uh, play with some sort of uh, kink solutions for these coupled field equations. And uh, actually, that's exactly uh, what we can, uh, what I, I want to uh, address uh, to, to finish this lecture, is that uh, we, we can also play with the motion of topological uh, excitations in the system, like solitons in 1D system, vortices in 2D systems, right? And if I want to uh, really to analyze what happens between these topological excitations and its interaction with its own uh, fluctuations, the fluctuations of the field, which is described by these, uh, describes these uh, topological excitations, we, uh, we have to play with something very similar to the model I've just shown you. And uh, usually what you have is Lagrangian density and you have the equation of motion in terms of these uh, conservative potential and we fix boundary conditions, for instance, for a kink. And then we can solve that with static limit. So we can say that we have a deformation. It's something like, remember yesterday, the washboard I showed you for the vortex lines. I can start to this string on one side and go to the other side. So that's exactly what the uh, kink is, or the solid. And now, what you can do is to use something that was very, very popular among field theorists in the 70s, namely uh, the collective coordinate method. And uh, with that, we can really uh, try to describe the coupling of the uh, elementary excitations of a field theory and some other excitation, which is a topological excitation of the same, excitation of the same field. And uh, when we do that, we can say that the soliton-like solution has, it's described by a function, which is its center, right? And all these uh, modes, these are coordinates of these uh, normal modes in the presence of the uh, the kink or the solid, and uh, but now there is a problem with the zero frequency mode in this case, and that's the uh, this translation mode of the solid. So if we uh, are careful enough to treat this uh, problem, and that's exactly what the uh, collective coordinates is all about, we uh, we can promote this x of t to the status of a uh, Operator. And then what we uh, end up with is the following, is the, the particle coupled to uh, the environment. And this environment is just excitations of these uh, original fields, but now in the presence of the kink. And the kink and this sort of uh, interaction is uh, dealt with with this Schrodinger-like equation for the uh, excitations in the presence of the kink. And uh, so what we have now is a reflection, transmission of these elementary excitations. It's like a string, but in the string, I can now make a sort of uh, deformation. Now, what about these uh, sound waves? Okay, they can be scattered by the kink or not. They can be transmitted through the kink. And uh, so that's what happens in many, uh, circumstances. For instance, vortices in uh, superfluids. And uh, actually, uh, there is a very nice paper published recently, uh, 2016, by these guys where they treat bright or dark solitons. But you can treat both, actually. And uh, in 1D channels with, uh, with a sort of uh, uh, both ice and condensed system. And uh, so we can we can have a sort of dark or bright soliton and 
they show that uh, what you have in this case is a sort of radiation damping, right? So uh, the former model is quite useful if you can make sure that we have a damping which is a constant in temperature, right? If you can make sure that that's the case, we are working with this sort of conditions and we can safely say that we have uh, constant damping down to very low temperatures. Okay, fair enough. We can use that more phenomenological model. Otherwise, we can develop things like this. And things like this are more closely connected to the model I've just shown you of a bath of bosons or fermions, right? So that's basically uh, what I wanted to say today. And uh, so I really wanted to present. There are other models too that we can, uh, they are more appropriate for dealing with many Brownian particles, for instance. But uh, to our purposes here, that uh, tomorrow I will uh, show you the uh, dynamics, the realization, experimental realization of some sort of a tunneling, coherent tunneling, the superconducting devices, and the K of the magnetization, superconducting symbols. These are more related either to, in either one of these two models. Actually, I could really uh, give this one here up because I'm not going to address some specific questions like this one, but I found it interesting to uh, mention this sort of possibility today, since there are many um, many people uh, working in uh, BCs in the audience and in São Carlos. So I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your lecture, very nice. And now we can open for questions, please. Okay, come here. I don't know. Which one the first, so you can just come. Um, thank you for the lecture, Professor. My question is a basic one in the problem of the damped harmonic oscillator. When we learn about, when we learn the introductory courses on quantum mechanics, there is the problem of the harmonic oscillator, which is neatly treated, and it's simple, and so on. But then there is kind of a gap, because we don't see the damped oscillator in the quantized form. Um, okay, so I think that your work can as you have exposed it to us today. It kind of fills this gap. But my question is, from a conceptual point of view, why is it so much more difficult to treat this dissipative phenomena in the quantum mechanical case as compared to the classical case? Because you need to model the environment and develop a full theory for this and so on. So why is this difference? Thank you. Oh, okay, first of all is that, uh as I said in my last, in my, in my first slide actually today, is that I was not going to address that debate on the uh, possibilities and ways to quantize dissipative systems. Uh, because the thing is, when once you want to apply canonical quantization procedure, what you have to do is to either write a Hamiltonian or a Lagrangian for your system, right? And uh, in order to do that, you, oh, 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 of course, it does not need to be a closed system. You can have some sort of uh, time dependence through an external force, but it's always something that you can treat within the uh, Lagrangian or Hamiltonian formulation. The thing is that uh, there is no way you can write a simple, uh, you, you can write a, 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 a the Langevin equation of motion from a simple Lagrangian or Hamiltonian. We always have to put some sort of uh, extra terms that will, uh, in the end of the day, that will uh, 
provoke some problems with uncertainty principle and uh, many other things. Uh, you can quantize, you can promote your variables, canonical variables Q and B to complex variables and try to make complex quantization. And you can also think about nonlinear Schrodinger equations. There is a whole lot of methods to try to quantize open systems. But my question is, why? Why do you want to do that? Do you, do you, really, do you really need it? Because the thing is, the, the, the dissipative system by itself is not is effective. So you have some effective dynamics. Because you, your dissipative system is always coupled to something. Since it's coupled to something, I think that the, uh, the best way to, to treat it is really to, to face it as it is. Namely, uh, that's an open system. So uh, let's close our universe, let's apply quantum mechanics to that safely, and then we can trace all the garbage we don't want to, uh, to look at, namely the environment. So uh, when you do that, we are back in business. So we can write down nice <clears throat> Langevin equations, motion, even in the quantum mechanical regime, we can make interpretation of that, and we can, it's a much more controllable system once we, uh, we close it and we make this sort of quantization that I, I showed you. Uh, that's my... Uh, <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, next one, just come, please. Um, hello, Professor. Thanks for the great lecture. Thank you. Um, the treatment that you showed me reminded me of the Brownian motors popularized by Feynman in the 60s. Um, does this treatment allow for description of these Brownian motors and Brownian ratchets so we can look at some biological transport of proteins inside cells, for instance? Uh, actually, uh, it's a very good question, uh, because the thing is, these ratchet and other systems, they are classical ones, right? So uh, the thing is fine, because you can model by harmonic modes, or if you can, you, you can say that, uh, right, uh, let's try to uh, look at some more, some biological system. And then uh, I showed you the uh, quartic potential. And uh, actually it was exactly in 1985, uh, some people, uh, they, they, they wrote a paper on the charge transfer in the macromolecules. So uh, there was this, uh, vibrational mode, and you can also put this big molecule in a solvent, and you can think about the transition, charge transition from one uh, nucleus to the other. And then we, uh, and that is very uh, closely linked to the uh, model I told you about, which is the uh, two-state system, two-side system in an environment. And so we can couple the vibrational mode, the harmonic modes in environments, and this uh, tunneling uh, mode. Actually, uh, Onushik, José Nelson Onushik, was one of the authors of this uh, very famous paper, uh, where it was uh, Onushik, uh, Garg, and Nabegalka. So I think it is back in, it was published in 1986 or 85. So, uh, these sort of applications in uh, biological systems, people really try to apply the same sort of uh, approach to these systems because it's quite natural. Because you can always <clears throat> uh, look at your uh, dynamical system as a subsystem that is uh, immersed in something else. And then you can ask all those questions. Well, what about uh, quantum mechanics in the systems? Can you really uh, block it? Or you can go to a regime, or you can forget, you know, all this uh, destruction of quantum mechanical effects, and then you have some nice 
pure quantum mechanics taking place. I, you know, it, it's quite a, it's quite useful to use exactly the same this approach here. And mind you, uh, the advantage of the uh, bath of oscillators, which I call the minimal model, is that uh, everything is ready, right? So, apart uh, from those problems where you don't really know what's going on or you want to go deeper into the... Uh, or you have some measurements that show you that it's not really the case, it's not a simple uh, Langevin equation, then you can appeal for other approximations. But the minimal model, you know, uh, takes care of, you know, uh, a huge percentage of all these uh, open quantum mechanical systems. Okay, thanks for your answer, Professor. Thank you. Any further questions? Anyone? Okay. As you don't have more questions, let's thank him again, Professor Caldeira. Thank you very much. Thank you. See, see you tomorrow. <laughs>
this presentation, but also probably for you guys that uh, come from different uh, research areas. Although uh, we might define a sort of unique uh, form uh, for the shape of the interactions, like 1 over R to the N, there is no general classification uh, or there is no unique uh, classification for uh, the effects that uh, long-range interactions uh, may display. And this has to do with the fact that different types of fields, uh, such as ultra-cold atoms or statistical models or many-body system, indeed, uh, though they, although they might uh, deal with the same time of, same type of interaction, the effects uh, that the, this, such interaction produce uh, might be uh, completely different. For example, uh, and this is probably something that uh, we'll have more time to, to discuss tomorrow, in the context of many-body physics, there are some certain types of non-local potentials, uh, such as finite range potentials, that at the many-body level display very similar effects to the one of pure long-range interactions. This is the case uh, of, uh, uh, for example, super-solid phases that uh, were already mentioned uh, during, during this call, school. I've seen uh, some uh, parts of the presentation by Carlos Sai already mentioned uh, uh, super solidity with the polar systems. So I'm pretty sure that you guys uh, might find a way to understand a little bit what uh, uh, the uh, line of, uh, of thoughts I will uh, be presenting today. Okay, so before going to such details, uh, let me first uh, uh, present uh, or motivate uh, the, um, the, the, the presentation by showing you a list of an incomplete list of platforms that display uh, long range interactions in the ultra cold regime. So the first two which are relevant for us are essentially magnetic atoms and polar molecules that display that actually have uh, an intrinsic uh, other magnetic or uh, electric uh, dipole moments. This is the case uh, for magnetic atoms of uh, atomic species uh, such as uh, chromium and dysprosium or, or erbium. And for polar molecules, there is a long list uh, like potassium rubidium, sodium potassium, rubidium cesium, etc. And some of them, in particular, uh, uh, there in Sao Carlos, uh, Emmanuel, as an experiment, is uh, building an experiment uh, for uh, uh, dysprosium include that uh, basically studies uh, dysprosium disease uh, that have a very strong dipole-dipole uh, uh, interaction. A second type, a third type, actually, of system to display uh, long-range interactions are uh, Rydberg atoms. There are also different types of, uh, of um, atomic species that can be excited to uh, Rydberg states. And on top of that, there are also Rydberg ions. As I briefly mentioned, this is a sort of an incomplete list because then there are, of course, ions, there are uh, atoms in cavities, uh, um, that display still a long-range interactions, but I would like to restrict uh, to these uh, three types uh, of uh, platforms for uh, for today. Okay, so what I uh, motivated at the very beginning is the fact that there is no general classification, there is no, sorry, unique classification, and what I would uh, like to deal uh, with uh, at the beginning is a sort of motivation for studying long-range interactions, at least uh, uh, from the scattering point of view. I've seen that in the uh, previous lectures, you already had the introduction to scattering. I hope that I will not uh, uh, bore you too much. But before doing that, let me remind you some very basic uh, general properties. And of course, this is nothing uh, new. You can find uh, several uh, reviews on uh, scattering in, uh, for two-body physics, uh, for example, in standard uh, um, quantum mechanical books, quantum mechanics books. So I took the, the book of Shankar and for maybe more applied to ultra-cold atomic physics, uh, the book of Stringari, uh, Peter Yevsky Stringari. But again, uh, there are uh, several ones. Okay, so let me uh, briefly remind you what is the idea of scattering theory. So suppose that we have a bunch uh, of particles that interact uh, uh, and through some uh, certain physical processes via a short-range interaction first, uh, which, which, which has a finite range. So you see that the potential of uh, via which the, the, part, the particles interact is localized in this region. So particles are named by A, B, C, etc. And uh, each one of them is described by a set of uh, kinematical variables that I will uh, collectively uh, uh, call uh, by alpha, beta, gamma, etc. So in 1D, uh, the scattering problem essentially reduces to the problem of reflection and transmission. So this is essentially what you studied uh, 
in uh, a standard course in an undergraduate or graduate course in uh, quantum mechanics. In 3D, the, the central quantity that one has to introduce is the so-called differential cross-section, and the integral of the differential cross-section gives uh, the total cross-section. Now, the cross-section is defined as the ratio between the um, number of particles scattered in the solid angle delta omega, here labeled in this pictorial representation, per second, divided by the number of incident particles per second per area in the row plane, so the, in the plane perpendicular to the direction of uh, motion of the particles. Now, uh, one has to, essentially one can rewrite the scattering wave function or the, the total wave function is sum of the plane wave, which is the incident uh, wave, plus uh, the scattering uh, wave function, which depends uh, in, on, on you, you can rewrite in terms of uh, uh, spherical variables r, theta, and phi. Now, from far from the scattering potential, then uh, you will have essentially that uh, uh, the, the equation that you need to solve for the scattering wave function is the usual uh, uh, nabla square plus k square applied to psi equal to zero because uh, you don't feel any type of uh, interaction far from the potential. And therefore, you can rewrite uh, the scattering wave function as a linear combination of uh, spherical and Neumann Bessel functions, which depend on the angular momenta L and the spherical harmonics uh, y, uh, y, L, M of theta and phi. Now, the fact that we need uh, a sort of scattering boundary condition implies that uh, we would like to obtain something which goes like E to I, K, R for very large distances. And given the uh, long uh, uh, or the um, asymptotic uh, expression for the Bessel and Neumann wave function, we get essentially a condition for these three factors, uh, AL and uh, BL here. And the condition for the such three factors is that AL over BL is equal to minus I. So we can rewrite, uh, essentially we can recast uh, this uh, expression for the scattering uh, uh, wave function in terms of this uh, equation here. So you see that it is indeed a, a spherical wave, it like KR divided by KR, times a quantity that we call the scattering amplitude, which is labeled here, which is uh, um, written here, F, theta, and phi. So F, theta, and phi, in F, theta, and phi, we basically encode all the properties of uh, the scattering process. Okay, so this is really the central quantity for, for scattering. Now, let me try to zoom in a little bit here. I have some handwritten notes in this uh, second lecture. So I hope that you can follow. If you don't uh, see anything, just let me know. I can try to repeat or can try to zoom uh, even more. <clears throat> my, my writing is not, uh, is not great. OK, <clears throat> so, the, so again, for short range interactions, the scattering wave function. So the scattering amplitude can be written in terms of what are called partial waves, which can be written in terms of, we can, which, is, which consists of a sum, essentially the total uh, scattering amplitude, the sum of over all angular momenta of a term here, e to, I, uh, e to 2 i delta L minus 1, where delta L is called a phase shift, times the legend polynomial, which depends, uh, depends on cosine of theta. <clears throat> Here, I am actually oversimplifying. I'm just taking, uh, for simplicity, a central potential, so potential that depends on R, but the discussion can be actually made be uh, similar for a non-central potential, just a little bit more complicated. Now, the total cross-section is uh, the sum of the, of, uh, the cross-sections for the uh, partial waves uh, labeled by the angular momentum variable L, quantum number L, and the, the partial cross-section is can be written in terms of specifically in terms of these uh, uh, scattering uh, phase shifts uh, delta L of k. Now, the interesting thing for, for us that we study ultra-cold physics uh, is that there is also some physical constraint on the uh, importance of each one of the scattering uh, of the partial waves. And the reason is that uh, not only the scattering, uh, uh, the potential is relevant, but also, as we know, the uh, centrifugal barrier is relevant. Once you write down this, the 3D Schrodinger equation in terms of uh, radial variables. And therefore, what you would expect is that if 
the energy of the particles that collide is not sufficiently high, so we are taking considering low energy scattering, then, uh, of course, if uh, the angular momentum uh, is sufficiently large, the, the uh, centrifugal barrier will also be large because it scales like L times L, L plus 1. So you might expect that at very low temperature, so temperature, uh, scale of temperature is KVT, much smaller than the value of the uh, lowest uh, um, uh, the lowest value of the um, of the centrifugal barrier, where B here is just the range of the potential. Here, this factor there should be also a factor of two here for L equal one because you see one times one plus one is equals two. So for temperatures which are much much smaller than the value or the largest value of the um, of the um, centrifugal barrier for L equal one, we would expect that all the partial waves uh, essentially do not contribute apart from the one which uh, uh, consists, which has uh, L equal to zero, which is called the S wave. Okay? So this is a sort of an important physical concept. How can we recast it, this uh, sort of observation in a more formal way? Well, we just need to look at the, the, exp of, uh, the, um, of the behavior of the partial waves as a function of K or uh, of the energy. The energy is case like uh, K squared. And therefore, what we find is that, that the partial cross-section scales like k to the 4L or energy to the 2L. So the lowest the energy, the lower the energy, the lower the importance of higher uh, partial waves. And typically for ultra-cold atoms, we just take the lowest uh, partial wave, which is the so-called S wave. Now for L equal to zero, so the S wave, one has that the scattering amplitude uh, uh, basically is a constant or can be uh, written as a constant minus AS where AS is the limiting is the limit for K going to zero of the ratio between uh, the scattering um, phase shift delta zero divided by K and importantly the scattering length depends on the details of the microscopic potential so in principle if you have some certain shape of the microscopic potential you can derive from the first principle the uh, scattering length. However, and this is the important fact, different potentials having the same scattering length display essentially the same uh, uh, low energy physics. What is the implication for that? The important thing is that for many, for most uh, ultra cold systems, you can then uh, try to m model the system that you are studying with the simplest uh, model potential or pseudo potential that you might introduce. This is called, uh, for example, the Fermi pseudo potential, which, is, uh, which tells us that the D of R can be written as a constant, so the coupling constant the G times a contact interaction potential, which can be written in terms of the scattering length as a four pi H bar square A over M times a delta of R here. I forgot to repeat the delta of R. So again, what is the message here for short range interactions? So the, the important thing is that for short range interactions, we, need, we can neglect all the contributions coming from the higher partial waves. We just, can, we just can focus on the lowest one, on the S wave. And for the S wave, we can write down an effective uh, model, an effective interaction potential, which is called the Fermi pseudo potential that encapsulates, uh, basically, that can be rewritten who, who, or whose strength is proportional to the only parameter relevant for scattering, which is uh, the so-called scattering length. Okay? Now, another important concept, uh, here, let me just adjust the slide, is the fact that uh, 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 symmetrization of the wave function is also very relevant for, uh, for ultra-cold systems. In particular, if you work with the uh, indistinguishable particles or identical particles, you need uh, the wave function need to be properly symmetrized. So for bosons, uh, you only expect to have uh, symmetric wave functions. For fermions or polarized fermions, um, you would expect to have uh, uh, anti-symmetric wave functions. So for example, for bosons, you would write the symmetrized version of the uh, wave function that we wrote before in this way. And the scattering, uh, the, um, the um, differential cross-section 
will depend on uh, the scattering amplitude computed for theta and phi and uh, uh, phi minus theta and phi plus theta, which correspond to uh, particle exchange and this sort of interference term. Now, on the other hand, for uh, polarized fermions, what we would have is that we will have instead the minus sign here instead of a plus. And the fact that the, the lowest partial wave for uh, um, scattering uh, goes to a constant, which is minus the scattering length, this implies essentially that the polarized fermions have vanishing even partial waves for short range interactions. And therefore, stop, that's it. So polarized fermions can be taken to be essentially formally non-interactive. And this is true, of course, for sufficiently for interaction that goes uh, that are sufficiently low uh, energy. Now, let me try to uh, build on this and focus on what happens instead for uh, what we would call a long range uh, interacting, uh, interacting potential. Now, for a potential that scales like uh, uh, one over R to the N, so I will try to, uh, please let me know, guys, if you want me to, to go slower than uh, these are written here, because I know probably these are sort of common concepts in the, in the field, but uh, maybe some, some of you have never seen them uh, and uh, I'm going through some several equations. So just let me know. Maybe in case Emmanuel just give me a feedback. I cannot see you guys very well because you are very small on my screen, but just in case, uh, uh, let me know. Okay, suppose that we now consider a potential that scales like uh, one over R to the N. One can compute the uh, scattering phase shifts that uh, uh, scales like uh, K, so the momentum K to the power 2 to L plus one, for a small n, so for L smaller than uh, N minus three over two, where N again is the power law of the interaction potential. Whereas the scale as K to the uh, N to N minus two for L is sufficiently large. So for L larger or equal than N minus three over two. So this means uh, that uh, in 3D, the ultra cold regime holds uh, when N is larger than, than three. And we can see this uh, properly for uh, a van der Waals uh, uh, interaction. So for example, for the van, van der Waals interaction, what we would have is that uh, by equating uh, the, the value of the van der Waals potential to the value of the centrifugal barrier, we would have, uh, we can define essentially a sort of van der Waals uh, radius, uh, which is a proportion to this uh, uh, C6 uh, coefficient uh, which, by which the particles interact. And R to the six actually enters here in the denominator that corresponds to the van der Waals radius here. We see that the, the, um, the, the ultra cold regime is reached for typical particle masses for temperatures of the orders of 10 to minus 4 Kelvin. So if we work at sufficient low temperature, let's say at micro Kelvin or even below, we can be sure that for if particles interact via van der Waals interactions, they can be properly um, described in terms of a unique parameter, which is, uh, again, the scattering length. So for this uh, interaction potential, one over R to the six, uh, or C6 uh, over R to the six, we can derive uh, the scattering length, uh, and uh, that description would be perfectly fine. So if you want to have uh, a proper description or a proper derivation of the scattering length for this uh, van der Waals potential, I would uh, recommend you to read uh, the book by uh, Patrick and Smith, where they essentially they derive the scattering properties for the van der Waals potential. Now, for the dipolar interaction, the, the situation is slightly different, because uh, if we take the potential that scales as one over R cube, we immediately see from this relation here that uh, n equal is equal to three. So this essentially a line uh, can be totally neglected. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, the k uh, scales uh, as uh, k to the, sorry delta l scales at k to the power three minus two, which is one, for all the l's essentially, and therefore uh, we immediately see that all the uh, scattering, uh, all the phase shifts uh, essentially have the same scaling, and therefore they all contribute to the total cross section. Okay, so you see that this is completely different from what we have seen in the case of a pure short-range interaction. Now, this means that uh, we can rewrite, uh, for example, the scattering phase shift uh, by including uh, the contribution of long-range 
and short range proportion. I just gave some two, I labeled them the strength of these uh, two contributions uh, with the letters A and B. Uh, for the moment, they are just arbitrary. And in terms of this, uh, uh, if we do some more pro proper calculations, we see that uh, uh, more detailed calculations, we see that the partial, the partial uh, uh, cross sections actually have two contributions for the even uh, um, partial waves. So one coming from the scatter length, the other one from uh, uh, the essential the dipole moment here. And then for the odd partial waves, we have this contribution here. So this means uh, what is the consequence of this? Well, we have the consequence. The important thing is that uh, for indistinguishable, indistinguishable particles, which are bosonic, we just need to sum uh, the essentially the even partial waves. For fermions, instead, we need to consider the odd. We, we have the odd partial waves. But as we, as we have just seen, uh, for even for polarized fermions, since uh, all partial waves, uh, also the, the, uh, the, how can I say, the, um, all the partial waves basically have the same uh, momentum dependence, we would expect them to have a finite contribution. And this as a sort of, uh, this is an important uh, uh, experimental uh, outcome, which is the fact that you can uh, use uh, the polar interactions to make uh, the polar fermions to equilibrate. This is not the case uh, for uh, uh, non-dipolar fermions, which are spin polarized, because essentially, they, as we have seen uh, before, they do not interact. For distinguishable particles, the situation is different, of course, because we, we might have the, the we might have to sum the contribution from both uh, even and odd uh, partial wave partial waves, because uh, we don't need necessarily to symmetrize the, the total wave function. And if, you, if you're interested into a review of purely dipolar systems, uh, where the, there is also some part, some sections on, uh, on um, in, uh, scattering properties of dipolar atoms, I would like to recommend this written, recent review by uh, Kim Manfau, Francesca Ferlaino, and, and others. Okay, so you see that there is a sort of classification of long range and short in range interactions by looking at the scattering properties. What I would like now to briefly mention is that you can do essentially similar types of classification, but now for a apparently completely uh, different uh, context. So for long range uh, systems in statistical physics, uh, the focus uh, is not certainly necessarily on the scattering properties, but instead uh, is uh, on the universal properties that manifest uh, themselves close to some uh, phase transition points. So one typically looks at the scaling of the correlators with some, which depend as some power law of the distance. And therefore one uh, would be, uh, and, and typically these, uh, since these scalings go as a power law, you can define what are called the critical exponents associated to those correlators. Now, using the definition, this, using this definition, which, as you can see, is dramatically different from what you would have for purely scattering processes that we discussed before. One is then led to a different type of classification, which I will just mention, not uh, justify in detail. So one can uh, obtain what are called strong long-range interactive systems, where n, the power law of the interaction potential, is smaller than the physics, the space dimension of the system. So if you are, if we are in in 3D, for example, we have strong long-range uh, interactive systems when n, the power law, is, for example, 2, 1, etc., or even a fractional uh, value. Now, this has a, a consequence, uh, important consequence in statistical physics, uh, because it, since we look at the thermodynamical properties of the system, so for an infinite number of, uh, of um, degrees of freedom, what one would expect to obtain uh, is, uh, for example, diverging the, the, um, the fact that if you compute uh, expectation values of some observables, you would ex expect them to diverge. One uh, thing, important thing uh, in, statistic, in classical statistical physics uh, is uh, the inequivalence of uh, the ensembles. And therefore, to overcome some certain uh, um, uh, divergences, 
one is also led to introduce some certain ad hoc uh, rescalings, uh, like for example the so-called uh, uh, cuts rescaling, that is important to, uh, to that basically inhibits the system or the observables to uh, diverge. Regarding this point, I would like just to make a, a small uh, um, uh, observation, very quick observation, which has to do with the fact that here we are only focusing on uh, the thermodynamic limit. Of course, uh, if we are dealing with a finite system, like for example, a string of ions, then uh, this problem does not appear explicitly because uh, usually the system is uh, of finite size. So you have typically 10, 20, 50 ions uh, in a row. And therefore, uh, of course, by definition, observables do not diverge because you are summing uh, uh, in a set of uh, uh, finite numbers. And therefore, this divergence problem uh, does not appear. Now, the, uh, the second class is the one which is called uh, weak long range interacting systems, where n, the, the, the power law exponent, uh, uh, is between uh, the space dimension, okay, varies between the space dimension and some, sort, some upper uh, n star value, where, which actually depends on the class of uh, physical systems that one has, uh, uh, one that is under study. For example, if it is Ising or ON models uh, or general OM models or Eisenberg systems, etc. And for this case, one obtains that the critical exponents really depend on the uh, characteristic uh, long range uh, uh, interaction. Instead, if uh, N is larger than uh, N star, one falls back into the class of short range interactions or even contact interactions. And therefore, uh, the critical exponents uh, are the one uh, which are typical uh, characteristic of uh, short range uh, interactions. Now, if you want to have uh, a more detailed review on this, uh, there is a, a review that we recently submitted uh, in, in September last year, which is currently under review, uh, where basically we detail uh, all these, uh, we, we discuss all these universal thermal and quantum and dynamical properties of. Uh, long range interacting systems. So this is not something that I will uh, be talking today, apart from some uh, features that uh, we'll discuss uh, uh, later. But of course, uh, you can uh, you can just have a look at this paper if you want, if you're interested in uh, further details. Okay, so let me now uh, talk a little bit, slightly more about the polar interactions, and then I will uh, move to uh, Rydberg so for the polar interactions, uh, the, the additional features uh, that you find in, uh, in atomic systems uh, is that uh, basically not only do they have uh, a, a power law decay as one over r cube, but they also show an important uh, uh, angular dependence. So depending on the orientation of the dipole, so you can have either repulsive interaction or attractive interactions. Uh, as I briefly commented before, the strength of the dipolar interaction is encoded into this uh, parameter here, uh, CDD, which can be recasted from which we can uh, essentially obtain uh, a, an effective uh, length, uh, which is called the dipolar length, that has to be compared to the uh, scattering length that we introduced before. So why it, it, is this uh, dipolar length important? Well, because depending on the strength of the dipolar interaction, we may obtain, uh, we may observe at the many body level, either a stable fluid or an unstable fluid. So the ratio here is the relevant parameter epsilon dd, which is the ratio of the dipolar length divided by the scattering length. And by analyzing uh, for a, an ensemble of bosons via, for example, the analysis of the gross pedayevsky equation that you probably already have heard in uh, the previous lectures, you will observe that uh, the system will be stable if epsilon dd is more than one or uh, unstable if uh, it is larger than one. Fortunately, I would say this is not really the end of the story because we know that already for classical systems, for strong dipolar interactions, uh, there are uh, the, these instabilities that I was mentioning sometimes leads uh, to some interesting uh, pattern formation. Now, it is nice uh, to see that uh, similar physics of, uh, occur also at the quantum level by the formation where this uh, instability indeed leads uh, in, uh, either in 2D or in 1D to the formation of uh, some uh, droplets uh, structure that were recently observed uh, both uh, with uh, dystrosium or 
or erbium in different uh, uh, labs. And in the review that I was uh, uh, suggesting uh, before, you can find really a nice description of, of all these properties uh, in, uh, in detail, both from the, mostly from the experimental perspective. Now, uh, the, the other interesting question that we addressed uh, recently is whether the same features occur also in a full uh, three dimensions. And for this, I will, I just want to refer to this uh, uh, work here from uh, 2017, where we basically uh, observed the formation of, uh, so this, this instability via the creation of uh, uh, long droplets or uh, filaments in three dimensions. Okay, so that's, uh, that's all for this introductory part on the polar systems. Let me now move on to uh, Rydberg atoms. So Rydberg atoms are uh, essentially very highly excited uh, hydrogen-like uh, atoms. See, so here we are looking at the structure of uh, a Rydberg atom where basically the external, the electron that uh, lives in the external shell can be excited to, to a state with a very high principal quantum number. The energy of the state scales like one over n square, apart from a small uh, um, uh, quantity, which is called quantum defect, that I will comment uh, on it uh, in, a, in a moment. And what we see is that the radius uh, and lifetime, uh, the, the strength of the interaction, all scale uh, like the uh, this n star, so this modified n star here, uh, by n star I mean uh, n minus delta. So it's not really the end star that I was introducing before for long range interacting uh, systems uh, in the statistical uh, uh, sense. So we see that the radius scales like n square, like the other atom, and the lifetime is uh, goes like n cube. So the larger, so the the larger the value of n, the smaller the or the, the the longer the essentially this electronic state will survive, and so we would expect much later much much smaller essential radiative decay from these highly excited states to the ram state. And interaction strength uh, importantly scales like uh, n to the 11th uh, power. And for this, of course, there are several reviews. If you want to have a look, uh, I just recommend this uh, sort of a uh, classic review by Zafman, Walker, and, uh, and Klaus Mölner. Now, let me try to justify a little bit more uh, why Riberg atoms uh, behave in this sort of exotic uh, way. I go back to, to my notes uh, and I want to basically try to convince you that uh, all these features can be understood uh, via some sort of simple semi-classical uh, arguments. So the idea would be, I don't know, I will probably uh, be able to cover just a part of this, um, of this discussion today, which will be related to the, uh, to the motivation of so-called quantum defects and uh, uh, to the interactions between uh, uh, Rydberg atoms. And if we have time, I just want to show you a slide on the implementation of uh, uh, quantum gates, which are important for uh, now for quantum computation, based on uh, the strong interac uh, interacting properties of uh, Rydberg atoms. And here I'm just, uh, just writing some uh, re relevant references. So for the quantum defect part, I would like to refer to this uh, array but more properly probably to this uh, nice book by Burkhardt, Atomic Physics. Instead, uh, for the implementation of quantum gates, again to the review 2010, and then there are other uh, relevant uh, uh, papers here. Okay, let's go back to the spectra of, of the alkalis. We see that we saw that uh, the essentially the um, they, they follow this uh, so-called Rydberg empirical formula, where the principal quantum number is replaced by n star, so n minus, now I call the, the quantum defect as alpha of L. And it, it can be seen that this alpha essentially only depends on the, on the angular momentum. It does not depend on the principal quantum number. So you can see here a structure of, uh, these, uh, of the energy of the, of the alkalis for some, uh, excited, for some excited states, so n equal two, three, four, five. So this is just for the hydrogen atom, and these are for lithium and sodium. And you see, you see here how they depend for fixed value of n with the principal quantum number. So you see that the, these quantum defects basically becomes smaller and smaller the larger the value of l 
because for uh, if you go from P to D, or for P to D to F for n equal 4, you see that the larger the value of L, the closer the states are to the values of the hydrogen, corresponding hydrogen atom. Okay, and the same uh, roughly occurs also for uh, sodium, etc. So, how does, and here I'm just putting some, some values, so you quantitatively see that the larger the value of L, the smaller typically the, um, so sorry, uh, on the vertical axis, the larger the value of L, the smaller the value of the uh, quantum defects. So how do we derive this? So how, how can, can we justify this behavior of these quantum defects? Well, first of all, uh, we, we want to rewrite these uh, energies of the, uh, of the coming from the Rydberg uh, formula as an expansion of uh, uh, 1 over n. And why is it so? Because we observed that we saw that uh, they uh, basically become, uh, they also become smaller and smaller the, the larger the value of n. Now, what happens is that if you rewrite as a Taylor expansion of this uh, Rydberg formula, you, you will immediately observe that uh, you have, uh, the, as the first term, you have the hydrogen atom energy plus a correction, which scales like 1 over n cube. And the prefactor is precisely the, the quantum defect. So in principle, this rewriting this equation in the Rydberg empirical form in this way, we observe that the energy of the alkalis can be written as the energy of the hydrogen atom plus a smaller perturbation. So in principle, by looking at the per by doing some perturbation theory on uh, the wave functions on the hydrogen atom, we can uh, we can obtain the value of uh, the uh, quantum defect and the, their proper scaling as well with that. And, and so how do we justify the, the presence of this quantum defect? So these modifications. Well, we know that uh, the alkalis have uh, just one electron in the external shell. But of course, uh, these other electrons uh, basically have some, uh, some effect on the energy. In particular, they, first, they are the reason why the, the full uh, interaction of between the external electron and the core of the atom is not uh, precisely uh, a Coulomb potential. So the shift uh, is uh, due to affecting non-Coulomb interactions that uh, basically perturb the, the picture of the standard hydrogen, hydrogen atom. So there are, the, the, there are essentially three uh, main uh, effects that uh, are responsible for this non-Coulomb uh, potential. The first one is a polarization effect due to the fact that this uh, electronic wave by n minus one electrons basically gets polarized by the presence of this external uh, electron. There is a penetration potential due to the fact that uh, this external electron, when it enters into the electronic clouds, causes a uh, uh, feels a sort of an effective non-coulomb potential. And then there are relativistic effects and the most uh, relevant uh, between among the relevant relativistic effects is a spin orbit coupling. So if you want to have a full detailed calculation of uh, all the effects, I would uh, recommend this paper here. <coughs> and let me just uh, sketch how to derive uh, the, the result. So uh, the important thing uh, is that, of course, uh, you once you have a, a, an equation for the for a, an estimate of this non-Coulomb type of interaction, you can just apply perturbation theory on the electronic uh, wave functions of the hydrogen atom. So the psi n l m are just the hydrogen wave functions. You compute uh, delta e, and then you obtain the scaling of uh, delta e as the function of m and uh, of n and l, and therefore this will certainly encoded the, the, the quantum defects itself. Another possibility is that uh, if n is sufficiently large, you can uh, basically recall uh, that uh, you would expect a correspondence principle to, to hold. And therefore, in a, an alternative way, which I think it's very suggestive, is uh, by essentially computing the um, time average of the non-Coulomb interaction over a classical orbit of uh, the external electron around the, uh, the nucleus. So for, uh, so for this, you know that uh, the T, the period, uh, scales like 2 pi uh, n cube. So this is just a capital law. So this is just classical physics. There is no quantum in it. When you replace, uh, when you replace uh, this scaling in here in the, the definition of the quantum defect, 
you already see the appearance of uh, N cube. Now, we, among the three effects, we just consider, for example, just the polarization effect, which, as I said, schematically is the fact that essentially is the energy that you would need to do to approximate this, uh, this electron from, to, the, to the nucleus. And uh, uh, by approximating, by getting closer and closer, it polarizes the electronic cloud in such a way that most of the electrons or most electronic cloud would try to be farther than to the, to the, to the other electron and little, a smaller portion would be closer. So you see this sort of polarization cloud. So now to obtain or to have an estimate of this polarization cloud, what we would uh, need to do is to first uh, compute the, uh, the, the electronic field created by this uh, uh, by the electron essentially, which is just uh, one over r square. The electronic nucleus and the n minus one electrons will get polarized. So the polarization will be proportional to the polarization constant times the electric field. So which enters here again. And the electric field by generated by number the dipole, which is basically the nucleus plus the electronic cloud, will be given by the by this expression here. So this is just uh, the, the, the field created by a single dipole. One, once you replace P with this expression here, you will obtain uh, this expression here. Okay, so I will not go into the details. It's not really too important, but if you're interested, I can give you my notes. Now we can compute the work. Okay. And the work is just uh, uh, the line integral over of minus the force uh, scalar product with delta L, so with the uh, past uh, made by the electron. And therefore, the force is just the charge times the electric field. When we do the integral from infinity, so plus infinity to a certain value of R, so the final value at which we want to compute this polarization potential, the uh, integral is, is trivial and we get that uh, it goes like uh, one uh, as minus uh, a constant times uh, one R to the fourth, okay? So at the end of the day, we found that the non-hydrogen, non-Coulomb part of the Hamiltonian uh, for the for an alkali is essentially scales scales like uh, minus one over r to the four. Okay, so once we we have this, we can go back to the, our estimate of the um, of the quantum defect, and therefore what we find is that uh, we just need to, to perform this uh, integral over a classical orbit. Okay, alternatively, what you can do again, as I already mentioned, you can just take this perturbation here and apply it to the electronic wave function, eigenfunctions of the, um, and the computer expectation value of this perturbation on the um, electronic, of the wave functions of the hydrogen atom, you will get uh, essentially the same result. And now let's do it classically. Let me just sketch how to do this calculation classically. So what you find is that uh, for a cl the classical orbit is of course an ellipsis, and therefore uh, with the eccentricity epsilon here, the, the angular momentum enters here, so just r squared times phi dot. And this is helpful because it allows us to replace the time, the integral over time, time variable, with an integral over the angular variable phi. And therefore, once you do this, you obtain, uh, you just replace the, the equation of uh, the uh, ellipse. I'm just doing this calculation for an arbitrary value of m, so r to minus m. So just recall that we have m equal to 4 in our case. So to do this integral, we just take uh, we take the binomial expansion for uh, uh, for a certain variable m of this uh, uh, term here. And what we what we obtain is that uh, is this expansion here. Now the integral over odd terms vanishes because uh, we are integrating from 0 to 2 pi. So you see the interval of cosine of phi is, of course, zero, cos cosine cube, etc. cetera, is zero, et cetera. But we also observe that uh, once uh, we, we go, we have a finite value of m, in particular, we have n equal to four, you see that this term is relevant. This term goes to zero because of the integral. This term is relevant because we have four minus two and four minus three. This term vanishes for two reasons. First, because it is uh, uh, odd, under phi and minus phi, and then, uh, sorry, no, because uh, sorry, because the integral go, uh, is equal to zero, 
and then uh, because for m equal to 4 this term is equal to 0 so we can expect by doing uh, by going forward with the um, with the expansion is that all the higher order terms also vanish so we have just two terms so we do we can do the integral for x minus 4 and then what we find out so this just these are just very simple uh, types of integral is that uh, Artman, the expectation value of R minus 4 goes like this. So we can plug this result uh, into the expression for the for the quantum defect by taking into account the fact that uh, the eccentricity is uh, 1 minus L square over N square. It is you can compute uh, as the from the length of the Runge length vector. So this is just the definition of you, you, you will immediately see that this is the definition of uh, the, the value, numerical value of uh, the, eccentric, the eccentricity. And then uh, um, retaining just the last term, the, sorry, the first term of this expansion, so one plus one half, you have the dominant uh, term for the uh, quantum defect. So you see that uh, the quantum defects uh, by uh, taking into account the scaling as one over our cube, goes like, uh, delta L goes like a prefactor, 3 alpha D over 4, times L to minus 5. So we immediately see that uh, the larger the angular momentum, the smaller will be the uh, quantum defect, in agreement with what we found from uh, the experimental measurements that I was uh, showing before. So this is actually an important, interesting result that, as, I, as, you, as you saw, I just derived it from semi-classical uh, uh, physics. Another interesting observation, and with this probably will, uh, I will stop for today, is that uh, uh, the Runge length vector, which is a conserved quantity in the hydrogen atom due to the accidental degeneracy of the, of the hydrogen atom, which has this, uh, this form here, okay, uh, is uh, the product of uh, the momentum uh, uh, cross product the uh, angular momentum minus r over r then uh, what you can see is that in the presence of uh, coulomb interactions of course is the conserved quantity and indeed uh, the classical orbit is just an ellipsis instead uh, if there is a non coulomb contribution so if there is a perturbation what you would expect is that uh, in principle the uh, the Runge length vector is not conserved now you can show that uh, the the length uh, so the, the the length of the Runge length vector is conserved but the uh, orientation is not conserved and indeed what the, the motion does what this non coulomb uh, correction uh, does is essentially a precession of the Runge length vector around the fo the uh, focus of the uh, orbit and if you uh, really compute the frequency of precession of the Runge length vector, you will, you will see that uh, the frequency of the Runge the, of precession depends as the, uh, goes as the derivative of the um, quantum defect with respect to the angular momentum variable. And therefore it goes like uh, one over L, L to the six. So with this, uh, uh, probably I would like to, to conclude just making uh, a very small uh, overview of what I presented uh, to you guys today. So first of all, uh, I started with uh, by motivating that there is no uh, unique classification of uh, long range uh, interactions. This classification, this classification might depend on the physical phenomena that you are looking for. So for example, for few body physics, uh, typically scattering processes are uh, the relevant ones. And therefore we saw that uh, short range interactions and long range interactions might be might uh, display different types of behaviors in particular we saw that uh, for the polar potential this has a, 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 an explicit uh, experimental uh, consequence due to the fact that uh, the polar fermions can indeed interact and lead to thermalization instead and or equilibration Instead, for statistical physics, the situation is actually different. You are interested instead to the power law decay of the, that, that interaction, which has to be compared to the spatial dimensionality of the system that you are studying. And then in the second part, I wanted to characterize a little bit more in detail the types of interactions for purely dipolar systems 
And then uh, for uh, river atoms, I was able to show you the uh, origin of uh, the uh, hydrogen-like scaling of uh, highly excited river states. So with this, I would like to conclude, uh, and uh, tomorrow we will go on by displaying some uh, other interaction properties now of river atoms and some applications uh, at the uh, many-body level. Okay, so thanks a lot for uh, your attention. And of course, if you have questions, just uh, you can just ask. Thank you, Tommaso. Uh, questions? I, I don't see any question. I think people are hungry. Um, well, if there are no questions right now, I'm sure people will keep their questions for tomorrow. So, sure. thank you, Tommaso, and uh, we meet again tomorrow. Okay, thanks a lot, guys, and uh, see you tomorrow then. Bye-bye.